hardest part is figuring out what you want to master. Focus on your product. Can you tell somebody that they suck? You gotta just go for This is exactly what I want to do for a living. You can't even tell somebody that their breath is fit for life. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to Short Story Long. This is the Super Pod, episode 100. And I got to say that I, uh, when I started this podcast, I thought about it more as like a little project. I thought I would go around and interview successful friends of mine. And all I guaranteed myself was that I would last one year. And after one year, if I didn't see some life-changing benefits, I would quit and be fine with the little project that I had created. But 100 episodes later, two years later, and a million good conversations, new friendships, uh, progress, incredible recommendations later. Uh, we're, it's stronger than ever. The listeners are stronger than ever. And so what I wanted to do was put together a hundredth episode super pod with three of what I would say the biggest, my most inspirational friends, as well as, uh, and two of which I gained from creating a podcast, um, as well as the best guests, the most well-received guests that we had on the show, right? Like I think Kevion was a big uh, shocker. No offense, Kevion, but I just had like you, the lowest <laughs> followers. Yeah, you came in with no like <laughs> social media juice. You weren't. You're not a celebrity, and man, your thing just exploded. Tom, obviously, you know what you're doing. You crushed it. Rob, you're a pro at this. So to have all three of you guys together on this 100th episode is really special. My goal of this podcast is to inspire young people looking for answers, and usually I do that in story form. Mm. I tell your story, you get to know them, and you get to learn the lessons that you guys learned along the way. We've already told all of your guys' stories, so if you want to hear those, go back and listen to them. We're going to try to get right to the gems and right to the magic and just ask the big questions that I get asked the most on this episode. So, episode 100, Woo! Mr. Rob Dyrdek. Yes, yes. Let me start first by saying Please. congratulations Thank on you. this 100th episode. Uh, very proud of you Thank as you. someone that's known you for the majority of your life. Mm -hmm. um, and just the idea, I think you said the other day that before you were drama uh, doing a podcast and you grew into a podcaster. Yeah. You know, and, and I think that that's the truth that not only has have you grown as a human being over these hundred uh, episodes, but as your cousin, so have I, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. and met both of these guys along the way and have learned so much and so many different things uh, that I have gotten from listening to the conversations that you have had that I implemented into my life and elevated my life and shifted my life. So yeah. as your cousin, yeah, who's your older cousin, mm -hmm. who's so proud of you, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you. That's the best compliment That's I can beautiful. give. That's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, Kevion. Yes, sir. Um, we met on this podcast. You shared some straight up gems, and then the funny thing is, we didn't know each other. Right. You said, "Hey, I got such a good response from that. I want to. I want to be your life coach." Yeah. And I said, "Hey, man, I don't know anything about life coaching. It seems a little crazy to me, but I will do whatever you want, yeah. and you run me through your program, and whatever happens, happens." And now we talk every week, seven a.m. on Tuesdays, and uh, you've you've brought me a long way, given given me a lot of good tools and a lot of good systems, and here we are, a whole nother. Uh, relationship that we didn't plan for yeah no it's been really awesome and i think the biggest thing that i've actually learned in being your coach being on the podcast like all of it is that at your core you know you were already this person seeking for more mm -hmm. you know like you didn't do short story long with the intention of i'm going to make a million bucks it was more of like i want to have these conversations with my friends i'd like to learn and hey why not be able to share that with the world? Mm -hmm. And I think that's really the foundation of what makes something awesome is when it's not about you. Mm -hmm. It's designed to make a difference in the world. And man, I don't even know how I snuck in here right now, you know, but <laughs> you're, you're the life coach, man. Yeah, man. You know what I mean? And it's just been, if what anything, episode number were you I on? was 50. 50, okay. Yeah, so if you 50. look back at the previous it's crazy. 50, halfway. Like, he yeah. was halfway. All those ones are kind of wonky, you know what I mean? 54 where there's, he's funny. sharp, he's sharp as That's can funny. be, man. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's, uh, it's been a big inspiration to me because this isn't necessarily what I do as a life coach. I'm a, I own a real estate company. Mm -hmm. But through, you, through seeing what you've done with the podcast and inspiring people, it's caused me to look at myself and realize, you, you know what? I'm, I'm supposed to do a little something else 
as well for the world. Mm-hmm. So it's been equally inspiring. And now you're also my social media coach. So yeah. thank you. And you're vlogging that. today. I'm actually vlogging today. That's <laughs> great. So you're doing for that. Yeah. I have two subscribers. So. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to double it after this episode. Yes. And then Tom, we met 100% through this podcast, mm. became friends, went and had a steak dinner. And like, and you, might I add that like three days before you reached out, I said, you should you should get this guy that True. was the CEO of, of Quest on your show like like a few days before and like literally you And guys, then his people reached wow, out. Yeah. Like that was the universe wow. would not allow me wow. to ignore Tom. Yeah. Wow. You know what I'm saying? You yeah. Tom yes, would not be denied. <laughs> it was like <laughs> Look at that. the synergy. Yeah. I had no option. That's and awesome. and Tom awesome. really blew my mind on uh, like the sort of neuroscience behind a lot of these things and the way that you think about success and habit creation and all of those things from like a almost like a neuroscience perspective, really, I mean, that was one episode that when we walked away from that, I was like, holy shit. Like, there was some real stuff in there that changed the way I looked at it. I went and ordered, like, five books. I think I ordered your whole reading list. Still trying to get through it. Um, And then the reaction to that was equally as big, right? Like, the listeners were just blown away. So, welcome, Tom. Dude, thank you for having me, man. And uh, I'm glad that Rob was over there with the universe colluding to uh, make sure that we met and... (laughs) That's been really cool. And like you said, one of the coolest things about doing a show like this is the people that you meet mm-hmm. uh, and then actually getting to know them, you know, yeah. off off mic, as it were, yeah. has been incredible, dude. And so getting to know you and seeing what you're about has been really, really cool. Thank you, man. I mean, one of my biggest pieces of advice to young people now is like, I don't care where you live or what you do, start a podcast, mm-hmm. even if you have no goal of it, it blowing up, because what it does is it gives you an excuse and a reason and creates the habit of sitting with someone that you look up to in any way for an hour every week. Mm-hmm. And that exercise is so important, right? Yeah. And people, a lot of people just aren't that like social. They don't think to go get coffee or go whatever. And this gives you an excuse. I mean, the excuses I've had to sit with people for, for hours and pick their brains on stuff that I would never ask them um, has been crazy. So everyone out there, go start a podcast. Do it. Guys, let's get into it. Let's do it. First question for everyone, and these are all like kind of highlights of things that I'm the most curious about as well as questions I get asked the most that I think you guys can clear up really well. Um, the first biggest kind of in-your-face one is, what is success? What does that mean to you guys? And what is like, would you say, the most common misconception about what it actually is? Well, I think the most common misconception is that it's money. Mm-hmm. and um, or accolades, something that somebody can point to. And, you know, as somebody who when I bring somebody onto the show, one of the first things I look at is, am I going to be able to tell that story? Am I going to be able to take the cool highlight reel that's going to make them sound extraordinarily successful mm-hmm. uh, to really capture people's imagination? But at the end of the day, um, to look at success like that is, is to fundamentally misunderstand the human experience. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, I think that the only rational definition of success is how you feel about yourself when you're by yourself. So mm. when there's no noise, there's no distractions, there's nobody to celebrate you or throw shade at you, it's just literally you thinking about you, mm-hmm. what do you think? And so I tell people the the goal of the game that you're playing, it isn't success, it isn't money, it's neurochemistry, right? Going back to, mm-hmm. because the funny thing is I don't think of myself as a neurochemistry guy, but for me to grab onto a path forward out of flirting with depression, feeling lost, not knowing where, where I was going with my life, I needed to believe that humans could change and adapt their minds. So I started reading a lot about the brain. And so once you understand that we're all chemical processing plants, mm-hmm. and at the end of the day, if you have all the money in the world and you wanna commit suicide, like what was the point? Mm-hmm. So conversely, if you've got no money, but you love life, you're on fire, you're passionate, you got relationships you care deeply about, then you've won. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's awesome. So I... That's professional, man. That's next yeah, level. I mean, that's it's next like, level. You can't even deny it. You know what, <laughs> I mean? who, what do you think about you by yourself is yeah. the ultimate that's purity. Good. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm kind so. of the opposite in terms of my research and studies. I'm the guy who has bought every single motivational book and made it to like page 10. Yep. So in the same way that he said it, my process or my way of thinking about it is just being happy, mm-hmm. Right. Um, it's feeling joy and being happy. And so for me specifically, it's about having balance. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm a big believer in the seven equities because um, the seven equities, mind, body, soul, family, friends, business, and money. I feel like when you have those things and you're paying attention to those things and really in order of importance, Mm -hmm. right? Like business and career last, that's when, at least for me, I just feel whole and I feel complete when each of those areas 
has energy that it's being spent on. Mm -hmm. So feeling good and and having balance and, um, you know, being able to come home and have a good time with my family. What's the biggest misconception also that it's money? Yeah, without a doubt that it's about the stuff. Yeah. You know, that it's it's outside in that the things of the world the cars the ice the money the fame the followers like that's gonna make me feel good it just made me feel good man it, it did, did man it like why did, why did you have to, why did you have to choose the word ice man like we're like the ice you make it, it, feels, so it cool. feels good if it, it does feel good but yeah. it's it's temporary yep. you know like you said how do you feel when it's just you and you're all alone and you're not with your things you know so it's that Success is outside in when I think it's really inside out. Yep. You know, if our hearts were to be on the outside of ourselves, what would we look like? Mm-hmm. You know, so I think just really digging deep into what's important for you and, you know, having a solid amount of balance in all the equities. Mm-hmm. Robert? I would like to start with what it is not. Yeah. Right. And what it is not is definitive in a single thing you literally have to work on it all day long every single day no matter what no matter what you've achieved no matter if you fail it doesn't matter it is so fluid and chaotic you are just trying to determine what are the boundaries that are success for you because if it's buying things if it's uh, being fulfilled if it's finding purpose if it's finding love finding time having energy all these things that that balance out to make you happy that is your definition of success then you have to work nonstop to stay calibrated to live in that because it's very easy along the way of finding a lot of success to then begin to over commit to things that lead towards your passion that pull you out of that balance when in fact you thought like no I'm really uh, this is what I love doing but in fact what you thought you love doing actually begins to make you feel less successful because you're overwhelmed or doing uh, too much outside of that uh, that energy that you've calibrated to keep success you know I think that's the 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 hardest thing to do with it is discover it for yourself because it's each individual and uh, but it's once you find the pathway there, you got all the energy in the world. Mm-hmm. It's like when you get there and you think you're there, it's just not some definitive place you're going to sit in. You have to now work and things are constantly changing. Like now you're getting married. Now you're having kids. Now you have to start another business. Now you got another thing. Like now a new person works for you. Someone you got a hot fire. Someone yeah. there's all of these moving parts. Um, and in a general form, if it is just to be happy, it's still about understanding how to manage staying in that zone of yeah. happiness. That really is the ultimate success. That's why I think one of the most fascinating things is everybody views success as this place you get to where you get to take your foot off the gas. You know what I mean? Have any yeah. of you, you've all had huge successes. Have any of you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like, ah, oh, now I can like. Hell no. Or like, Absolutely what's the longest, not. like a vacation, like a five-day break? No, but I would prefer to be home, honestly, than being on a vacation. Vacations, to me, are even harder because now I'm, it's just like, now I have four human beings that I just have to make sure they have the time of their life. And I'm like, man, this is a lot of work. <laughs> I'd rather be selling some homes. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. no, I love vacation with my family. But, yeah. um, <laughs> man. sorry. Man. Alana, he didn't mean that. Man. Sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> No, it's, it's you know, new levels, new devils. It's yeah. like, I think success has a lot to do with your ability to deal with uppercuts and deal with failure. You know, like they say, it's not what happens to us, but it's how we react to it that matters the most. And so I've never experienced that. Like, my business has gone insane in the last five years. Mm-hmm. You know, we went, I went from selling 10 homes a year in 2012 to uh, last year selling 225 and like some half a billion in volume. <laughs> um, and it's crazy and it's it's just, nothing has really gotten easier. It's just that I have more people in place to help me do what I'm inspired to do. Yep. You know what but I mean? But let me ask you, there's no point that you're ever, there's days where you're like, man, I just, I this whole thing is just, I'm over this whole thing. Are there any, are there any points where like the, the entire journey becomes a struggle for you. I haven't experienced that. Um, I've experienced times where there's changes that I need to make to continue on this path. But as far as my actual 
um, career and my my journey. Like I love it. You but know? you're saying Robin, like a day where, like you're just like screw this whole thing. I'm over it. Yeah, like you know, like to me, like what's the end, right? A lot of you ask, like, is there ever a time you wish you said success where people think it's where you just chill, you yeah. know? And I think even for me, along the journey of doing so much, there'll be, like, like I have a ripcord plan in the in the back of my my mind that like I'll just sell all this and move to La Jolla, but you <laughs> yeah. know what I mean? Like, but in you the think sense, you could actually do that. Because I know you couldn't. Right. And, and look, my wife would say the same thing, but she's like, let's go. Yeah, right. Yeah. You know, and I, it's just that idea of of like, even though for me personally, I like to put a put a flag in the ground of where this is all going to end and what the purpose of it is. It doesn't mean I have to end there, but it, it it's it's giving me a definitive ending rather than like doing it for the rest of my life type of mm. thing. You, I could go on to do it for the rest of my life, but I'd rather put a flag in the ground on when it's going to end. And then I have a vision for how I would, where I'd spend the same time and energy that I'm trying to chase success mm. or growing wealth, uh, creating ideas. Like how can I then turn that to growing my children, growing physically different, enjoying different things, physically enjoying traveling different things like, that sort of aspect of it, I still envision an end. Right. right. Like, but can I ask you this? Because mm -hmm. I've known you now for, for quite a while and you've always had that end in mind, right? It's just changed. You've never actually felt close to it, right? You've well, never yeah, actually but, felt like, ah, oh, this is it. Yeah, but I would say that I operated in chaos for all those years and yeah. never was able to define it. And yeah. then once it was, since I spent all that time to actually define it, now every you're you're walking towards it so clearly that you actually see it right and that doesn't mean it doesn't it won't change either i don't trust that that five years from now i don't be like oh no like it's but like this is what i'm gonna do now yeah. you know I, because that's always kind of how it's been but it's le at least when you get up each day like uh, you know for right now i've had the same ending for two years mm -hmm. and it's just it allows me to say no to everything and have so much clarity mm -hmm. but but even in all of that there's still times where i'm just like man i'll take the money and run man i'm headed to la jolla yeah. somewhere like well let's buy a house in hawaii and like fish yeah you know? but and you know you think about that if you did do that because like i'm a firm believer that how you are in one area is how you are everywhere let's say you did do that you did go to la jolla i bet your fishing game and your parenting game would be on this crazy complex level. Like your kids would be little karate, Japanese speaking, just all kinds of just It's giving me masters. way too much credit. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> I'll be sitting on the couch. It's right? Yeah. Yeah. It's it's because if we're not, I think if you know, if we're, like my, my best friend Jonas would say, if we're not growing, we're dying. So the thought of just like chilling and doing nothing Oh man. Yeah, but again, it's not chilling and doing nothing. It's evolving in other ways. That's like, what I mean. It's like yeah. like you you forever will be growing. I think all of us that's our nat who right. we are naturally as human beings. That's what's led to us to the super pod. Yeah. Right? Uh, because we're even like studying superpod. ourselves on a daily basis like, you know, it's like I every single day I listen to something that that gives me some sort of nugget and 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 new thing to to think about. Most recently um reading the high performance habits or listening to the audio book and and it was there's a whole chapter about like sustaining it and mm. it was the first time that someone like rather than just trying to lead someone to it it was more about sustainability you know and that whole idea of always make the one thing the one thing mm. or the main thing the main thing you know and it's that sort of uh concept of you'll never change right as someone that wants to constantly get better and grow because i think we could all testify to to like how much better we are than 10 years ago yeah right and it's like that's actually what we're most addicted to right now we each have our own individual like uh, measures of success and what we're hoping to achieve but that whole idea of like i would i would say and now i'm getting kind of arrogant here but i'll speak for all of us like we all look back at like god like we were lucky back then we were making moves that were yeah. so reckless and dumb and now it's like we're so calculated and we're so like and we know like 10 years from now we're gonna be like damn we were like yeah. we're just going mess. for it back yeah. then yeah, yeah man that's good yeah it's interesting i think that um you know like you were saying there are times for sure where i think you know what am i doing and why am I working this hard? Why am I pushing as hard as I'm pushing? Should I just, in my mind, you know, for my wife and I, it was legitimately, we sat down and had a conversation. Do we buy an island and retire? Yeah. Or do we try to build something new? And 
you know, to put our fortune back at risk and to do something new. And what I realized, so I, one of my favorite quotes is from J.J. Watt. I don't know if, I'm sure he didn't think of it, but he's the one that really popularized it. <laughs> Success is not owned, it's leased, and rent is due every day, mm. right? So becoming successful is not in any way, shape, or form for anybody listening out there. It's not like you walk through a door and you shut it behind you and now you are permanently in the safety of success. Yeah. It, even your money at some point, right? Like even just with inflation, your money becomes worth less over time. I remember the day I realized that putting your cash under your mattress, you're spending money to do that. That's the mm -hmm. craziest thing in the world to me. I couldn't believe that. And so even just understanding that stagnant money becomes less money over time, I was like, okay, there's something about the forward momentum you know, you were quoting your friend saying that we're either growing or dying. Um, that's certainly true on a success scale. But then there's the other part of it, which is I have fallen in love with the game of business. Now, we could do a whole podcast on defining what the game of business mm -hmm. is. But here's the thing that I want for everybody to fall in love with something that you love, quote unquote, playing mm -hmm. that your physical limitations do not become actual limitations. So if you want to play in the NFL, your physical limits, the way that the human body ages right now is going to stop you. Yeah. We've had extraordinary players make it into their 40s, but I don't think we've had any that have made it into their 50s. Mm -hmm. So that's going to leave if you live the average human lifespan, that's going to leave close to 40 years where you're going to have to figure something out, let alone the guy that are done at 26, 27. So business for me is that sport. Mm. It's a sport where only my mind matters. What I can pull off intellectually, can I outthink people? Can I figure out what's really going on in the market? Can I better serve my customers? Like that, and there are some lonely fucking times in that where you're yeah. like, I'm not sure I'm gonna pull this off. Mm -hmm. Like I may lose a lot of money. And when you get to the level of the game that we're playing at, there's a lot of commas and zeros mm -hmm. on what you're playing with. Mm -hmm. But if you can love that game, and it's like, dude, I'm glad that I was in the Super Bowl. We lost and that sucks. But like Russell Wilson, that time that they lost in the most horrific and embarrassing fashion on the one yard line, his reaction was so inspiring, I can't believe it. And he said, whoa, whoa, whoa. You want me to be like upset and depressed? I got to throw an interception in the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. Like how awesome. many people even get to be put in that That's situation? That's too positive. That's too positive. <laughs> I, I, I knew it would be you. I knew it That was, that was pretty, yeah. pretty positive. I loved it. I thought that's the only one. It's the only way to emotionally survive yeah, a sure. moment like that. So yep. you kind of have to do that. But I thought that's how I look at business. Like I just want to play. That's cool. But even like, cause you're 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 one of the people that, one of the few people that I've had on my pod that had the moment of like a big payday, and you had I think we talked about the moment of like checking your bank account and seeing the payment come in and whatever. And even in that moment, like how long did that last? Of like I'm rich, like was that like <laughs> yeah. a day? Was no, it, it lasted a little bit longer than that. And one thing I want people to understand, I'll give you the actual timeline, but one thing I want people to understand, like the thing that always bothered me as a kid when you'd meet wealthy people and they were successful and they're like, money's not everything. And you're like, that's easy for you to say, right? Yeah, yeah. But the reality is people don't give away their money until they die, basically, right? Mm -hmm. And they're saying that this has intrinsic value. And it does. And I want people to know forever and ever and ever, whether it's seashells or it's cash, people are going to chase money, whatever the currency of the day is. And the reason that they're going to do it is because it's real. Now, what I mean by that is it has actual power behind it. But you have to understand what money really is. There are many things that money is not. Money is not going to make you happy. It's not going to make your relationships better. But money will facilitate. So money in and of itself is inert. But money, when you know the thing that you want to build, when you have a mission in your life and you're trying to make something come true, money is incredibly powerful. So like right now today, I woke up and in fact, before the camera started rolling, uh, Rob and I were talking about this is, so I'm building a, a comic book empire is in the easiest way to say it. And mm -hmm. so when you think about who I'm taking on, I'm taking on Disney, mm -hmm. right? Who owns Marvel? So it's when you're going to go into a game like that, I have the finances to, even if I go in and lose millions, tens of millions of dollars, mm -hmm. I'm still rich on the other side, mm -hmm. right? There's so much power in that, mm -hmm. that you can try to build something you can think outside the box because I don't have to beg for money. I don't have to convince anyone, which means I can be totally counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. And that, that's how you win. To win, boys and girls, you have to bet against everyone else and be right. Mm -hmm. Now it's twofold. You've got to have the, the cojones to bet against everyone, but you have to be right. Mm -hmm. And to be right, you have to get good at business. So money is powerful. So the whole sense of like, being wealthy and how grateful I am for that. Yep. Like that hits me every day. Yep. But the moment that sense of like, whoa, I just got a lot of money dropped into my account literally in a span of 30 seconds. Yep. It was one of the most surreal experiences of my life yeah. to go from paper equity to like cash. Yeah. That moment lasts, let's call it a week, two weeks. And what'd you do? Well, the important thing for me was that day, 
I went into the office and worked as normal. Yeah. Nice. So no one would have known that that day I became like multi, multi, multi millionaire. Like yeah. they just, they would have had no but, idea. But let me say this to you, to what you just said too. It's the one big thing that, that this day and age doesn't fully understand is that liquid dollars are ultimately what matter, right? Mm -hmm. Like paper dollars are not. Like a lot of people think like, I'm gonna start a company and raise money and all oh, my company's now worth $30 million and, and right. you're worth $10 million on paper, but whether or not, uh, you know, you lose a big client, you lose, uh, you know, a, a, a big group of customers, whatever it is, and now your company's out of business just like that, your millionaire on paper never existed. Liquid dollars, however you choose to attain them, uh, is is how you actually accumulate wealth, right? But I, I I think the biggest point is what what that sort of what we'll call f uh, phase of your life, right? Allowed you to now chase an even bigger dream in inside a a less dangerous zone where it's like now you've you've created your own freedom and now you can take this risk yourself, you know? And and I think. You know, I don't know why I think about it all the time, but I always think to myself, like, being a millionaire is always weird to me, right? And and even though it's been, like, for a really long time, it's like I still I still picture myself as just, like, a normal mm -hmm. person, right? <laughs> and, and what money actually does, I'm incredibly, I mean, I of the 22, like, holdings we have, we have five investments and, and uh, 17 builds, right? And I've put up so much of my own money to build those and invested all my own money because it's, it's, I don't want to manage somebody else's money or necessarily ask for money at the beginning stage because that's the hardest. When it's just an idea, like that's the hardest time to get money versus like once you've proved it, you know? But because I already have the foundation, it makes it so much easier for me to take those risks that. I often contemplate how difficult in, especially when I'm trying to inspire or talk to other entrepreneurs, it's a different, my risk tolerance is different because I could lose it all yeah. and I'm still fine, right? It's, it's a, it, that's actually one of the beauties of money is it just gives you this deep, deep sense of security to continue to creative and play the game. Uh, without the stakes being so high personally. You right. know? I think mm -hmm. what's interesting about it from my perspective is that that you guys have all reached a point where the younger version of yourselves would have moved to La Jolla. You've already reached that point. Like right? You had the point of the actual payday. It came at once. You could have moved to Hawaii. You've all had the point. So I think that the interesting lesson in all of your guys' success is you're still working harder than you've ever worked in your life. And now it's by choice. Yeah. And so that goes back to success is not the ending. There is not whatever, right? Like it's in the it's in the struggle of it all. It's in the process. It's not the moment because you've all had the moment. You've all had your childhood selves would all be like, holy cow, I am richer than I ever could have imagined. And you're all working harder than you ever have in your life. That's what I think is interesting for people to hear. You know what I mean? Because it's proof for that money isn't the thing, that the destination isn't a place that you yeah. know what I'm saying? Well, for me personally, I don't feel I don't feel like I've experienced that yet, right? Mm -hmm. Truly, we, my wife and I, just bought uh, our dream home. That's for sure, two months ago, mm -hmm. and now I still need to pay for this thing. So <laughs> I'm not, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but what's it's exciting because three years ago in 2014, 2015, we bought at that point what we felt was our dream home, and then we got comfortable with that, and we're like, well, is this possible? Mm -hmm. You know, if anything, the only way I don't feel that I I could move to an island or buy an island or move to La Jolla. I'm not at that place. <laughs> but it was interesting. A dude was working on my house the other day and he goes, does it does all this scare you? You know, like my monthly nut, what I write is like 50 grand a month. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what I'm expected to pay after everything. And, he, and I go, it doesn't scare me at all. You know, because I'm not attached to any of it. The reality is if I lost all of it and I had to maybe move somewhere else and restart, the equity is really myself and my mind and my skill set. Mm -hmm. And that mindset, that skill set um, is something that, you know, unless something occurs, I've got that and I can move and shift. The only thing I'm really afraid of is... Um, falling off of my relationship with God and falling off of my sobriety. Mm -hmm. Those are the only two things. Mm -hmm. Other than that, if I'm right with God and I'm sober, 
that my wife is good with me and I'm good. Mm -hmm. I, we can go anywhere, we can do anything. Yeah. So my main equity is not in my ability to buy an island yet, but it's in my mindset and my skill <laughs> to be very, very good at what I do in real estate. Yeah. Yeah. I wanna buy an island. I got you, yeah. let's do this, I'll write it up. <laughs> Both of you guys, oh, yeah, you're right. let's do this. Yeah, you need to start looking in La Jolla, get a jump start. <laughs> um, start let me ask you this, because I have a tremendous amount of like, I guess maybe empathy for young people that want to win so badly, but can't for the life of them figure out how. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, uh, I know that this is a severe comment, but I think that a lot of drug abuse, jail time, unnecessary domestic violence, a lot of these things come from people being lost and having all mm -hmm. this energy and all this will to do things and grow and whatever, but just being lost and not knowing where to put it. Yeah. Obviously, we know that the way that school works is pretty flawed for like at least the stuff we do, right? Yeah. Um, but what would you say, if you could say, if you could look at the youth of this country and pinpoint what you think the number one biggest reason for people not being able to achieve what they think that they could achieve is, what is that reason? What's the main thing holding people back? Mindset. The, there's literally nothing else. Mm -hmm. And... You know, when you were talking, Kevion, about, okay, we, we have the dream house, but then it's not the dream house two years later. Right. It's, is this possible? And the magic in that question, is this possible, mm -hmm. is everything. And so having worked in the inner cities as much as I have, and this literally changed the course of my life, I took an extra credit assignment in college, and I tutored this kid. It was supposed to be for eight weeks. His name was Rashawn, and right there in South Central Los Angeles where I was going to USC, and um, at the end of the, the eight weeks, that's week six technically, you're supposed to say, hey, I'm only coming for two more weeks. I told him he went absolutely bananas, ballistic, freaking out on a level. I had literally never seen a human throw a tantrum like that, and he was wow. eight. And so I was like, is this because I said I'm not coming back? He says, yes, and I say, all right, look, if you do your work as soon as I get here, because he would sort of game me mm -hmm. uh, when I went to help him with his homework, if you'll do your work as soon as you get here, as long as I live in Los Angeles, I'll, I'll tutor you. Mm -hmm. And so that turns into this eight and a half year relationship. And he was abused and I didn't realize it and he got taken out of his um, home. And so he named me the guardian of the court and I had to see him into foster care and all this stuff. And he was absolutely, and I'm like in my early twenties at the time, I have no idea, I'm in way over my head. Um, and I just thought this kid is so amazing, but he's gonna continue to struggle because he has no sense of what's possible in life. Now at the time, to be honest, neither did I. Mm -hmm. And so I used to just take him to see movies in Beverly Hills. Cause I was like, the movies cost the same, so whether we see it in South Central or we drive into a beautiful neighborhood, at least I want him to see that there are places like with green grass mm -hmm. and just that there's beautiful things in the world. Then flash forward, whatever, 15 years later, I'm running Quest, I have 1,400 employees, about a 1,000 of which grew up hard like he did. You know, in abusive families, in, um, you know, in gangs, uh, they're either dealing drugs or family members dealing drugs. And so it was just crazy, incarcerated, nuts. And so I, in the interview process, because I put out onto the street, Look, we'll interview anybody even if you have a felony record. And so we had people lined up around the building. It was crazy. Mm -hmm. And I started asking this one sort of filtering question, which is a magic genie is about to show up and grant you one wish and one wish only. What do you wish for? And to a person without exception, and you should all right now be calling bullshit because how could you ask, how, how many people did I offer this out? Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people I asked this question to. Mm -hmm. Every single one of them gave me the same answer, and the answer was a million dollars. Mm. And that answer changed my life. And I realized they, they're they encountering a magic genie and they only ask for a million dollars. You can't buy an island. You can't buy a house in La Jolla. You can't even buy a house in LA. Buy a house in Studio <laughs> City. Right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Studio yeah. City. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I was, yeah. Like, yeah. I was like, guys, this is crazy town. I'm like, you could ask for a trillion dollars. You could ask for a machine that prints money. Like, whatever. And you ask for a million dollars. It was It was so bananas. And I was like, all right, literally... The only way to solve the kinds of problems that you're talking about is to show people that it doesn't matter who you are today, it only matters the person you wanna become and the price you're willing to pay to get there. Like how much effort are you willing to pay to put into that? How big of a question can you ask when you say, is this possible? What is this? Mm -hmm. If it's the million dollar house, you're not gonna go very far. But if it's you know something truly extraordinary and you're willing to work for it, then you can get there. So that mindset just to believe not that you're capable of something today, to simply believe that the human animal is the ultimate adaptation machine. We are literally designed from the ground up to grow and change, period. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. That's good, Tom. Same thing, man, I Tom think the is, same man, thing's just yeah. not as cool. 
Uh, no, um, without a doubt, mindset. I think it's three words, um, and I think it's the the thing. The biggest thing that stops people is the biggest lie that we get caught up in believing, and it's the three words that I'm not enough. Mm-hmm. You know, through whatever happened when you were a kid, or you know, you raised your hand in school and you you, you didn't get called on, or you failed the test, and you labeled yourself at some point. I think it's very common from the age of four to seven. Um, that something happens and we tell ourselves this thing. And that thing is usually, I'm not enough. Mm-hmm. Something, something similar to that. And I think it's being able to break through that um, and realizing that it's not, you're not missing anything. You know, you have what it takes. You have the ability to achieve your goals and dreams. There's not some special class that you have to take. Yes, that will help. Um, you know, you don't have to have a certain set of parents. You don't have to have a certain education. It's just a belief. Mm -hmm. And if you can shift your belief that I am enough, I am good enough, like I can do this. If you can trick your mind, which is in itself a whole other topic that I'm sure we'll get into, Mm -hmm. but um, what holds people back is just this idea, this make-believe story that I'm not enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and look, I I think creating belief is what you also have to do i think there's the the gap between the want of success and then the understanding of what it takes to get success is is so far from most people and and even learning how to uh, teach yourself to look at a big idea and break it down into small ideas and then break it down into actionable ideas uh, that become believable so that when you see it all together, like, yes, I can do that. Then you're taking one step at a time. And I I think it's just, we all think like that. We all live like that. It's how we became who we are. It's second nature to how we think. And I think, you know, as much as we can, we try to preach that to people. And and every successful person always talks about the understanding your goal in detail and being able to break it down into action and be able to get there. But that's actually like a skill that's not taught. Right. And so now, now when you're someone that has a desire to do something, but has no knowledge in a place and you have this incredible passion and, and, and lack of self-awareness to know how much you don't understand, but you keep putting all this energy and spinning your tires more or less, ba- basically embedding disbelief mm. even further into yourself. You know, I, I think uh, people misunderstand, like look at going in, you know, the age old, find a mentor, go work in a place that you eventually want to go be a part of or whatever it is. Like that experience begins to create the confidence. The confidence is what, uh, gives you the ability to take a big risk and and create a plan to even go achieve whatever that may be. And I think it's age old. It's think and grow rich to Dale Carnegie. Like you know, it's like the age old sort of 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 principles of what it takes to actually achieve something. Most people don't take the time to build out a clear pathway and then gain confidence by slowly making their way to it. Right. So let me ask you each of this, like okay. in sort of a quick, quick version. Like, so now I've just heard that. I know that uh, that is true, and I think that I'm probably guilty. Right? I'm uh, one of the listeners. I think I'm guilty of this. I want to change. What do I do? What do I do right now? Like, how do I hit pause and make a change so that I now can get, get start gaining the right mindset? Maybe I live in Minnesota. What do I? Where do I go find? Th- you know what I mean? Like, because I think that one of the biggest I think one of the biggest problems is an education is offered to us, Mm -hmm. right? And so we take it because you think that the way the world would work is you're offered this education, you take it, the better you do at it, the better you'll do in life, pretty easy. I think what everyone's learning and the reason why the Gary V's of the world and all this content is becoming so popular is because people are realizing that's not the way and the way is kind of here on the internet a little bit. It's as close as I've heard, right? Um, Where would you steer people to go to if they want to go from spinning their wheels and nothing making sense and starting to get a little bitter to wanting to become an achiever of any type. Hold, let me just say something real quick. Yeah. You're, I mean, you're a college hater on this show pretty su- substantially. I wouldn't now, say Now look, hater. now look, and I'm, you're talking to a guy that didn't finish high school. Yeah. Uh, but I, 
I don't want to pigeonhole education as some sort of like dead end road. There's mm -hmm. all the really gifted, smart people that have clear uh, visions for what they want to achieve. Education is this great turbo boost yeah. towards that, mm -hmm. right? I, I think the the same way that uh, there's a million and one people that listen to you and Tom that that get all fired up and don't do anything, right? It's like it's what it actually takes to turn it into to action is the super difficult part, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and I think whether it's going to school or going to learn a set or, or some other skill, whatever it is, that's a really deep lunge into creating. If you want to start a business, going and taking a business class so that you understand the fundamentals of, of yep. how to even operate a business would be a great action step because running a business is incredibly dynamic and super hard. Yep. That's why you hear so many stories of people learning by fire where it's like they just get in there and they, they learn through all the failure and the chaos to when they come out of that with a refined lens that finally allows them to figure it out to go on and find success. So I think any any bit of action of learning what it is you want to actually achieve you want to be in real estate it's like really going to real estate classes and learning how it works getting a great mentor to teach you sort of and understand what it is but at the end of the day that is not enough to be a successful real estate agent you still have to go out and apply that and begin to learn the nuances of what it takes to actually close a deal you know yep. what I would say is this to your point I don't I think that the people that you're especially talking about that went to college and come out these like super high achievers, my argument would be they had the mindset part figured out, yeah. right? I think the people that I'm trying to look out for are the people that thought I played by the rules. I went to high school. I did well. I went to college or I didn't. I did well. And you're missing that part. And it's like, how do you steer them towards that part? How do you... I think that's the majority and I think that's why a lot of people are frustrated is because they do get any sort of traditional education and then things don't really pan out the way that yeah. you kind of thought it would, right? Because you're missing this part that we're talking about, right? And that's why people are taking in podcasts and taking in all this information so rapidly right now is because this looks a little bit more like the truth than what I heard in school is what yeah. I'm saying, right? So I'm just saying like where do you – where do you steer pe people? Is it books? Is it podcasts? Is it can that even help? Is it mentorships? Is it like what is it? I think it's uh, I think it's all of it. And if you if you take a look at why is the generation now interested in books, interested in podcasts, they're not getting some certificate, right? Nothing's happening when you're listening to the podcast. But what's happening is they're having a being shift. So I think it's three things in order for somebody to take action to break through. Number one, like I said, it's realizing the lie. The lie is I'm not good enough. The lie is I can't do it. The lie is I'm a loser. The lie is I'm stupid, whatever it might be. And so because if you keep the lie and you, then you graduate and you still have the lie, you're not going to get very far. Mm -hmm. So step one is you have to recognize the lie. It's a total make-believe story and you've got to first catch that. Mm -hmm. Step two, I believe, is developing clarity with what you really want. Because I know what it's like to work at Starbucks. I know I'm talking about opening my own coffee shop. But if I don't really take the steps to figure out, well, what city is it in? How many square feet is it? What's the name of it? What's the logo look like? What's different about our coffee? It's never going to happen. Mm -hmm. So I think recognize the lie, number one. Number two, develop clarity. Write that thing down. Like realize your life's a movie. You got to come up with the soundtrack, the cast, the energy, the feel, the environment write it down and i think when you start to write it down and chip away at it you realize like damn maybe i can do this mm -hmm. you know what i mean like maybe you can kick flip all right cool well what's the difference of kick flipping and kick flipping 10 stairs mm -hmm. right you have knees, to, knees and ankles <laughs> you got, right you have to be able to picture yourself doing it because i know what life looks like here but i don't totally know here so i can talk about it but until i develop clarity it's not going to happen and then step three, I think, is just doing work. Mm -hmm. You know, once you have the, you've gotten over the story that you are enough, you have clarity, you've got some sort of plan of action, go screw up. Mm -hmm. And go into it knowing that a key to winning is losing miserably. Like, I'm a professional loser. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's why I <laughs> succeed. I break through, I won't give up. And if you go into the game knowing that, Every single no gets me one step closer to a yes. You have that mindset. As you're experiencing defeat, you grow stronger. 
You know what I mean? Like we we knocked on 250,000 uh, doors in the year 2015 and we sold 100 homes. Mm -hmm. So that means 249,000 people told us to F off. Mm -hmm. It's a bad conversion rate. <laughs> <laughs> it was our first full year as a team. You know what I mean? But it's the mindset that you have to have is knowing like, damn, I'm getting closer. Mm -hmm. And if you screw up and you think, well, that's it. You have to know every single no is getting me closer. I believe that three-step process, you're golden. Get over the lie, develop clarity, do work, and enjoy the process. Let me let me ask something to, to Tom and Drama unconnected to that, right? Where, you know, I think you both know my deep obsession with clarity right where my entire life is tactically planned out now it's the chaos of executing it right and the, and even the skill set and the mastery involved and what it takes to achieve everything that i want is completely mapped out and the opportunities that present themselves now are put through that filter based off of what my complete path to the end of it all for the rest of my life is right that's the depth of clarity now Drama will push back on me, right? Of saying like, that's too, you're, you're keeping it too tight. Like there's, if you would have done that earlier, you wouldn't have done all the stuff that you did. I say, yeah, but it was chaotic. I would have been, you know. So I uh, know that Kevion thinks from that lens. I'd be curious if you have a definitive plan that you're executing against from, from a life plan or it's built in stages. No, I'm a psycho for clarity, and I'll. I mean, if we have to take drama out and browbeat them, I'm down for that. <laughs> um, any anybody that gives people any message other than your level of clarity will determine the level of your success. Period. And so, as long as there's any ounce of vagary in what you're doing, you you will not succeed. And the reason is this. And this is the example I always give to people when I talk about the level of specificity you have to have. So people come to me, <coughs> excuse me, all the time, and they say. Uh, you know, Tom, I want to be successful. Oh man, fantastic. In what? I want to win a gold medal. And they think that's it. They've, they've said it. I want to win a gold medal. That's success. Okay, rad. In the Olympics? Yes, in the Olympics. Wonderful. Winter or summer games? Summer. Great. Tennis or swimming? Swimming. Fantastic. Which stroke? Because until you get down to exactly what event it is that you want to win the gold medal in, I don't know how to train you. And so that's where people start. I don't know if I'm supposed to give them a tennis racket or give them the speedo so they can go swimming. They're, they're that unclear when it comes down, comes down to the tactical. And since at the end of the day, this all comes down to the tactical and you cannot get there without a freakish level of clarity that you have to be able to write it down. You have to be able to say it to somebody in a single sentence. Mm -hmm. Until you have that, you just won't know how to learn. And the learning at the end of the day is, is the, the main juice. And the one thing I will say to anybody listening to this, first and foremost, be prepared to become extraordinary. That's it. And when I hear about knocking on 250,000 doors, the first thing I think is, yeah, that's how you get good. Like if you knock on the door and don't think about why you didn't get the sale, then you're just yeah. going to knock on 250,000 won't mean anything. Yep. But if every door you get a little bit smarter, like by the 251st thousandth door, if I could say that you know, over here, I saw that smile keeping on face. Like that number, uh, you you will be so wicked smart. Like in terms of how to get them to hear your real message, you'll have developed your value proposition, all of that. That you're going to be able to close and get that sale. Yeah. But it's being willing to put in that work. It's having clarity of vision to know what you want. It's believing in it, having a mission, something that gives you more energy than it takes. And I cannot stress this enough. Like. Rob, you are the classic example of this. Some of the things you've done in your life are so terrifyingly difficult and physically painful <laughs> that if you didn't have some love for the intrinsic thing, you never would have kept doing it. And so people finding that thing that they like and getting over the other lie people tell themselves is, well, I could never make money doing that. Mm. And I can't tell you how many people say that about the most amazing things. Like when I was a kid, it was, oh, I can never make money at video games. Video games have made so many millionaires, some billionaires, like it's crazy, come on. Like mm -hmm. you dismiss it. If, you, if it's giving you more energy than it takes, it almost doesn't matter as long as you can meet your need for shelter and food. Mm -hmm. So go after that thing, build some business savvy, and then execute against it. Now that was all high level shit. Now I'm gonna take you into the weeds. If you're driving right now, I want you to pull over. Because you're going to write this shit down because it will change your life, but only if you let it. 
So number one, what you repeat in your head matters. Everything Kevion has been talking about here, which by the way is all genius, and so hopefully you're already pulled over and been taking these notes. Thanks, But man. what you repeat in your head matters, right? That lie, that story, like what you're telling yourself about yourself is everything. So you've got to take control of that. There's a guy named Dr. Daniel Amen. He talks about squishing the ants, the automatic negative thoughts. We all have them. I don't think the goal is to get rid of them. I think the goal is to recognize rapidly that you're having them Use it as a habit loop trigger to reinforce something empowering in your mind. So if you think, I can't do this, I'm not enough, do the nice, simple thing. Humans are the ultimate adaptation machine. So even if I'm not enough today, I can become enough. I can become worthy. Now, this is the hard part. To have self-worth, you have to do something that's worthy of believing in yourself. And I wish that that was a, a thing I could just give you and that, hey, just by saying you're worthy, part of you is going to call bullshit on yourself. So do something small, do small incremental wins. I hate the gym. So what's the first thing I do in the morning? Mm -hmm. I go work out. Why? Because every rep I do past the point of not wanting to do it, I earn credibility with myself. I'm improving the story that I tell myself. And it's dead simple. It could be push-ups at the end of your bed, whatever. But do something that you don't want to do, but is leading to an outcome that you want and celebrate that so that you've got the credibility. All right, the next thing that's important is become a learner. Change your identity. Right now, most people think about, am I worthy? Am I smart? Am I good? Am I right? Drop all of that and think only, am I learning? If you're willing to sit at somebody's feet, of so brilliant what you said drama about this podcast gives you the chance, the practice of sitting at somebody's feet for an hour that you admire, which most people won't allow them to admire somebody because then that makes them feel diminished and they want to feel cool. So then they don't even get that chance to look up to somebody and to ask their questions. So be the learner, that's huge. And then change your sense of self-esteem from being smart, being right, to identifying the right answer. Once you become obsessed with the right answer, regardless of who came up with it, you're gonna win, because you're just ferociously looking for that next thing. And then the last thing is what you say out loud matters. So what you say to yourself matters, and what you say out loud matters. So when you say that you're gonna do something, then congruence is gonna make you act in accordance with that. So Rob has his mission. He knows exactly what he's marching towards. Now I'm sure within your inner circle, everybody knows exactly what that is. And so you're now held to a standard to march towards it. Part of the reason that I got in front of the camera behind the mic was to say shit out loud that I'd be super embarrassed if I don't do it. And so on those days where I wanna to move to La Jolla, I, I say, <laughs> look, I said I was gonna do it and I'm gonna do it. Yeah. So those, those are the, the things. They will tactically, at a tactical level, change your life. Yeah. So the and question, like the, 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 the question there. drama, the question <laughs> drama is, do, are, are you going to build a very specific life plan? Yeah, but I feel like I have one. I feel, <laughs> like, do, I, okay. I feel like our, uh, our, our, debates? Is, our debates are not on clarity necessarily, like just straight up clarity. I do believe yeah. in clarity. And I have a recording that Kevion walked me through of all my goals for the end of by December of 2018 and also uh, 2025 or whatever it is of exactly what my life is going to look like at the end of 2018. Okay. Um, so I do believe in it and I have it with the business. I think that my thing is more, I don't even remember what our debate was about. I also think that one of the issues that ties into this that I see the listener uh, having a problem with is some people also can stack the odds. You can build Mount Everest in your mind, right? So you say, well, I want to do this. Well, that's going to take this. And then I'm going to have to find someone to do this. And then I'm going to have to. And you just build this mammoth thing, this daunting goal. And I think that the part that I can't stress enough is just taking steps. And yeah. it's, like, it's like hiking up a hill. Like you look back and you're like, damn, I went that yeah. far? That's crazy. But you don't think every step, am I there yet? Am I there yet? Right? And it's that sort of mindset. I right. just think a lot of people here uh, building the detailed goals and putting it all in the plan and build this insurmountable thing. Uh, and that's why I always try to urge people to just do something today. Like yeah. figure look, it, out the it, clearest look, you and can it, and it, do something. It goes both ways. And I'll, you know, I think our argument is it, rather than you – planning out your, what your vision for the podcast was going to lead to, mm -hmm. which I would argue uh, would be the, the right way to do it, right? Yeah. So, you're, so you're doing, but you just jumped in yeah. and discovered it got better and let it become and, and helped create a new path, right? Yeah. There's, there's, there's even that way that matters. It's That's one of the example. things that made me so impressed was like, it wasn't just like, damn, he just went for it. And then, 
you created your own lane with it by just jumping in rather than trying to validate it in some form or another or put it to something larger, you know? And I, I think also, you know, even for someone like me, it's that self talk and saying it out loud is, is the most important, you know? And I, yeah. I think we could all to all agree to that. And, and, you know, I really wanted to meditate. I couldn't meditate. I had to buy a, a meditation machine that's got lights and sound, and I can sit in it every morning. Sick. You know what I mean? To get my, in order to get it work. Otherwise, there's just, I got to do it at five in the morning every morning to, uh, to try to get my mind right. But in there, I start the day by just like putting a vision to all these things I want to happen and all these positive thoughts and all these positive, like it's literally 20 minutes of just putting vision to everything and changing even how I talk to myself. So then as the day begins that I'm just like charging into the day with the self-talk from the positive way, because it's so easy for the pendulum to shift the other way, which then can, can begin to pull you down. But also it, pushes away the energy that could possibly help you or pull you out versus when you're just constantly like thinking of of yourself and ideas in a positive manner that's when things tend to show up that help support that idea uh versus the the other side where the things don't show up and perpetuate the negative negative side of it but i i do really believe so much in how you actually speak to yourself and speak to others about what you want to do will play the biggest part in manifesting it do you believe in like straight up manifestation? Like in the most psychotic way ever. <laughs> like I to the I, point I thought so, but I just didn't know if you were gonna hit me to with To the like, point well, where I of. feel like it's on me to control my universe. Yeah, like, like to it's the, up to you. Like I swear to God, I don't want to get too hokey in here. <laughs> But I get in that dome at five in the morning and I will specifically <laughs> meditate 20 minutes straight on what I want to happen specifically. And that it day will, or how long? It, like, how far I just say it over and over and over in there and specifically even with with the pickup of ridiculousness, right? Yep. Like where I'm rather than like like I just spent like three days picturing myself in season 14. <laughs> Right. Right. Like yeah. how weird that. Is. And it was just this. I woke up one day and was like, you know, they're about to we were doing a deal to pick up the next season and we shoot 30 episodes at a time. And I was like, man, like you need like, you know, how how much. Uh, this is your cake and eat it too, you know, where you get to produce it, you get to control it, you get all your talent feed, you know, like it's so, you've got it like a machine, it's so easy to do. You know that this is your cake and eat it too, but imagine how amazing it would be to have uh, multiple seasons instead of just kind of focusing on this next season happening. And I I kid you not, it, the negotiation started and that's what led to the unprecedented deal of signing a deal for 168 guaranteed when the most we ever had guaranteed ever before was 30. And it was, I, the negotiation trailed that way for no reason. There was nothing even leading to it. And even when I, you know, I don't want to get too into the details because I feel like they'll be like, damn, this motherfucker. <laughs> But it's still the reality of rather than approaching it of you've only you do this on a season by season basis, like start thinking in your mind of out there and what it would look like. And it and it comes alive. Right. And, and you know, whether it's my wife, whether it's like the building I'm in, whether it's like the, the entrepreneurs that I have companies with, it's like I feel like like most of it is built where I'm thinking it through so deeply, then it comes alive, right? And and I, then at a greater responsibility is I can also control things in a negative way, yep. right? Because I will put that, sometimes I'll get caught, like if, I'm, if someone's bothering me or a situation's bothering me or someone involved, I'll almost like breed the battle that, that happens like three days later. And it's yeah. something that that you learn to control but use in... It, the the hard part is doing it consistently and never letting it go right not not allowing your mind to to drift back into negative things because you'll manifest those just yeah, the same it just way it seems like yeah. a lot of responsibility you're just crafting your own universe like what if you just have like a crazy messed up thought and you're like oh shit look, I, look i've thought. had the vision of like arguing with people and like it has come straight alive where I was already preparing the argument and now, now I'm just like yeah. like going through the stuff like like that I was even preparing in my head and 
most recently I have this weird like I keep thinking about having an argument with my neighbor and I have to keep telling myself like man if you don't you got to keep killing this thought man you're going to end up arguing with your neighbor for no reason because I parked my car where his trash cans are you know like keep you got to be careful has it, has it came uh, to life yet? No, no, I keep breaking it off. And now that I think I said it out loud for the first time, I think well, me and the neighbor are good now. Okay. <laughs> As he listens to this, he might spark that fight just to have the manifestation right, yeah. come to life. <laughs> but it was cool because you said that's a lot of responsibility. And I think it's actually that, that right there is the key to realize, yes, and it's your responsibility. Because we lose the power to manifest when we put it on the world. When you act like this is happening to me, you don't have any power. When you stop and say, I'm the creator of this, and it's all biblical, right? As a man thinketh, so he is. It's, it is our responsi responsibility to say, this is what I'm up to. This is what I want my life to look like and jam it in your mind that it's possible. And back to like the crazy visions and the crazy plans, like my plans are super simple. You know, I'm running close to a billion dollar real estate business on a, uh, bullet point list of goals mm -hmm. you know what i mean mm -hmm. because that's all i know like i have basic bullet points for what i'd like to do and i just focus on really i just focus on the things that i need to do every single day i have goals but i think about you know what if i do these actions i feel good at the end of the day because mm -hmm. there's only so much i can control so lately i've been less concerned with the goal in the end zone and more focused on here are the things that i'm good at and what can I do to do these things at least five hours a day? Mm -hmm. And no matter what happens, if I do these five things at the end of the day, because I turn things off at like five, mm -hmm. I want to get home to my family, I feel good. You know what I mean? And I think as soon as you realize, you know what? These are the things that I'm looking to manifest. You'll see it happen like mm -hmm. that. I mean, our new house, it's ridiculous how this fell into our lap. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, my wifey and I were just kind of dreaming of what the ultimate house would look like. The square, the square footage, the lot size close to an acre, mid-century modern, floor to ceiling windows, over 5,000 square foot. And we literally wrote down a price that was a million dollars less than what that would occur for. Yep. Probably 30 days after that, I, we weren't even seeking it. I got a call from somebody who heard about something that had happened and um, I get invited to go to court and speak on somebody's behalf. Long story short, my wife and I, I'm in Seattle. She sends me a text. She's like, hey, 5,500. She sends me the address. She says 5,500 square foot on a text. Check. Mid-century modern. Check. Lot size, 30,000. Check. Kids school district. Check. And then we put price and question mark. We, I went to this court thing with an offer, a million dollars less than what the real value of it was. And the family just said, yeah, we need to get this off of our books. Let's do this. We were nowhere close to prepared to make that move. Mm -hmm. And I called my wife and I'm like, you're not going to believe what just happened. To take that a step further, it's on a golf course because we also have the ability to manifest. Is this the golf ball story? Dude. Tell that one. That's the one that's like. So, but before you get into the golf ball story, I just want to say like, that's the, that's the depth of clarity. Yeah. You didn't, when you map out, God, this is what, you had no idea what it was, would ever actually be or where it would actually be, but you built the parameters, the framework of what you truly wanted, and then it came alive, right? Like, yeah. that, that's the importance of specificity, specificity. See, you and I are both having strokes today, <laughs> that's all right. Yeah. On understanding exactly what you want, and, and to me, like... I literally have that a hundred of those pockets. That's so awesome. as it comes alive, it is like one thing after another, right? Anyway, it's a go ahead on the golf ball. Golf we think ball. it's a coincidence. We go, oh my gosh, this happened. Yeah. And then we're like, we need to really own the fact of like, yeah, that's how it happens. It's a three-step process. Ask, believe, receive. Mm -hmm. And our energy is our signals to the world of what we're asking for. You don't even, so you, yes, it's powerful to say it. But the reality is you can just feel it and now you're a magnet to that, good or bad. Our energy is a magnet to what we want more of that's congruent with that energy. Mm -hmm. We feel good, awesome things should hap just happen. You feel bad, you spill coffee on your shirt, it's a whole day of crap. So the key is to feel good. Speaking it helps for sure. So we get the crib. The golf ball, give us the golf we ball. We get the crib. And I keep asking people, hey, how common is it that golf balls hit your house? And I'm like, ugh, maybe every 15 years max. 
<laughs> and so why do I keep asking people this question? I don't know. I ask the neighbor, meet the neighbors. Oh, how's your view? How often do golf balls hit your house? Yeah, it's been here 40 years, you know, it's happened three times. Okay, cool. I keep asking people. The night before we closed escrow, I told my attorney, I was like, I just really feel like a go golf ball's gonna hit my house. It's the same reason why I don't go in the ocean. Um, because a shark will bite me for sure. <laughs> just have that out. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to the ocean. And I, she's like, why do you say that? I said, because I keep thinking about, a, I just keep talking about it. I know it's going to happen. She's like, well, stop talking about it. I'm like, I can't. And so anyways, we close escrow, and maybe 15 minutes go by, and wifey and I are Instagramming in the backyard. Whoa, whoa, this is crazy. <laughs> Boom. And she leaves. She comes back, and she's busting up. I'm like, what happened? A golf ball went over the 17th hole, over our whole lot. We have a tennis court, over the tennis court, and into the back window of our Suburban, which, <laughs> dude, this has never happened in history. It went over the house. That's a bad golfer. It went, and what? The kicker, though, is the what? The kicker is, I manifested exactly what no, I wanted no, the for The kicker it. is that on the golf well, ball. On the golf ball, there was a K on it. In Sharpie. In Sharpie. Mm. <laughs> That's but a good one. here's how I, I looked at it, is that I manifested it, and I manifested it in the most inexpensive way possible. The mm -hmm. universe is like, look, dude, I'm going to hook you up, and I'm going to do this at a really low cost. Your insurance <laughs> will cover it. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So, Tom, do you do, you, do you do any of that stuff or no? I was just going to ride out in silence, bro. Yep. But, uh, yeah, but yeah. if you ask me straight up, no. I think that... Um, that you get what you focus on. There's yep. no question. Meaning, if you're not thinking about it, if you're not putting in the work, um, you're never going to get there. If you think negative thoughts, you're going to feel negative. And then because you're in a negative state, like you're just going to act in accordance with the way that you feel, mm -hmm. right? So there's so much truth to that. Um, but there's a saying in the brain called the reticular activating system. Because you're talking about a golf ball all the time, when you see a golf ball, it's like, oh my God. Now, if that just happens to be the one time that you get hit, then you know, you're know you still on the same track. It's just that your mind was primed to think of it as, as potentially something mm -hmm. bigger. So you don't and believe in manifestation? Not, not in the way that you guys just talked about it. I yeah. think that it is not a coincidence that two of the hardest working, most like dedicated and driven people that I know are like, you think about something and that shit just appears. It's like, <laughs> you motherfuckers work your faces off to like but what about be the on the but golf course But it's the inexplainable ones, like, man. Take, take a guy that isn't able to get a house on the golf course because he doesn't like put in the work and all that. And he's like, I'm convinced the golf ball is going to hit my house. It's never going to hit his house because he didn't do all the things to be in a path where a golf ball might hit his house. Yeah. Right. So just thinking, this is like the movie, The Secret. I thought it was amazing mm -hmm. if you squash the 20% where it's like, and if you just think of a parking spot, a parking spot will appear. <laughs> like if you just sit there and think about a parking spot for long enough, parking spots appear because that's how parking spots work. Yeah. People get in their car and they leave. Yeah. Um, but no, I, if, if that were the case, then I could simply go into the inner cities and really teach these motherfuckers how to like think about something. I get your think tank. I would put them in it and we would manifest, you know, yeah. hundred million dollar homes. That would be that. But I really think that it's a combination of people who have a deep belief in themselves, their lives, they take the action. I mean, if you play this back, right, the thing that you were saying was, at the end of the day, you gotta act. And you were saying it as well, right? Like, you'd never see that that one step leads to the next, leads to the next. Mm -hmm. Like, that, that you put yourself on a tractor beam course to be hit by a golf ball. Like, everything, you had the check marks, all of it, gonna make the offer, all of it. Like, you set your life up to put yourself in the path of a golf ball. Mm -hmm. So that I fully get. And I believe in that so much that that's why I was just going to stay silent. Because if people think I'm saying don't fucking obsess, you, you've got to be scary the amount of time that you think you just fantasize, think about. My wife and I used to drive through the mansions of Beverly Hills and just be like, one day we are going to live there, man. We are going to live there. We would point at houses, this house, like that, this style. You know, you go, you, we didn't have Pinterest boards back then, but like cutting stuff out of magazines yeah. and like mm -hmm. this style house, mm -hmm. that clarity, putting it out there. But the reality is I built a nutrition company and that gave me the money to go buy one of those motherfuckers, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So by then I knew what I wanted. I had the drive when it was getting hard and it was late nights and everybody else was out partying. I had spent so much time thinking about what I wanted that I was just going to keep going and keep going. Nothing was going to stop me because I had the clarity. I was obsessed. So the statement that rings true to me mm -hmm. is your obsessions become your possessions. Mm -hmm. So if you obsess over creating something, 
amazing and magical and you put your energy and effort into thinking about it, which you have to do. Mm -hmm. Like you've got to bring yourself around. You've got to meditate over those things that you want. And that's, dude, you, I'm pointing at Rob for anybody that's not watching, like you're the way that you own, like, look, I want a big house and I want big businesses and I want to build things that generate a lot of revenue. I think that is so important in the cultural narrative right now. It's like become taboo to talk about building beautiful things, big things, expensive things, like manifesting that and bringing that into your world and building towards it. And I think it's beautiful. Like know what you want. And from there, and this is my favorite Jay-Z quote is, I got rich and gave back to me. That's the win-win, right? Mm -hmm. I can't help the poor if I'm one of them. Mm -hmm. So knowing what you want, going after it, building it, whether it's just thinking about it or whether it's taking all those steps to create it. Like mm -hmm. once you believe, you believe, that you're capable of getting the house on the golf course, of building the just sheer number of businesses that Rob's built. Like when you believe that you can do it, you start taking the action steps. Mm -hmm. And I just believe that even if I'm wrong about the manifesting part, I know I'm right about taking action makes things, the, the probability goes up a million fold. And I don't think these guys would disagree with that. Mm -hmm. Look, I, I got to double down. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I'm in awe of what I've been able to, to manifest right and it's on so many different levels that is so inexplainable and nothing to do with the position i put myself in but sheer inexplainable coincidence right and i look at it as almost a skill that i've got better and better at at using as part of my toolbox toolbox for success and learning how to recognize it and and so to me uh, yes, I do all the things that that put me in the position to create and find a lot of things, but there is so much inexplainable things that have evolved on so many levels of my life, right? From how I met my wife to how I got my lot that I'm building my dream home to how I got my office, right? Like it's these things that are, are completely outside the realm of of putting yourself in a position and sheer like how in the world did mm -hmm. that happen right and you know I, I you know even if i was to explain my my office i got i went to um upfront ventures in santa monica and they had the pet top penthouse of a building and i was like god i just this is what i need this is like the vibe that i need to be on right so i got the loop net uh, app in my phone and they referred to me as LoopNet Larry down in Beverly Hills, right? Because I acted as my own agent. I was just going from building to building to building, like knew I wanted this new new sort of of life outside of the fantasy factory and and uh downtown LA and wanted to be close to my home, wanted to build this 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 sort of new long term life plan that I was right next to my office. I wanted it to be in in Beverly Hills or adjacent so it was beautiful and and in a, a better location and on the 4th of July uh, or on the 3rd of July I had been on LoopNet nonstop nonstop I just hit my phone and I showed it to my wife I'm like look at this fucking shit it was just I, I wasn't on it nothing it just appeared a penthouse of a of a building that said sublease Beverly Hills entire floor exactly like upfront ventures I'm like I just straight up manifested this, right? And she's like, oh, my God, like, you really did, right? So July 3rd, I call the guy. I'm like, hey, uh, how you doing? Like, um, uh, this is Rob Deerdeck. I was I was hoping to take a look at uh, the, the penthouse down on South Beverly. And he's like, well, it's Sunday, July 3rd. I could show it to you on Tuesday, right? I'm like, no, 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 I get that. I get that. Okay, cool. Let's set up a time on a Thursday or a Tuesday. Told her, get in the car. We immediately drove. I talked to that. It was probably at 10 a.m. We drove straight down on a, on Sunday, July 3rd, and pulled right up to the building. And right as I was getting up, someone was walking out. I said, whoa, 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 excuse me. Where, where are you coming from? He's like, the penthouse. I'm like, can you take me there? So at 1030, I sent this guy a text. The guy took me up into the penthouse. I sent this real estate guy the text. I said, <laughs> I'll take it. Like, I'm in the middle. He's like, what? <laughs> so then... The guy who let me in was like, hey, like, it's already been rented, right? So then I text the guy. I'm like, yo, it's already been rented. The guy's like, no, 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 I can get out of that. I can get out of that. Then he gives me the lease or gives me the number of the guy who is leasing the building. And that guy calls me. He's like, yo, what's up? Like, crazy to crazy that, that, 
that this would be you. Like I was in Turks and Caicos when you were there. Me and my, me and my fiance were there the same time you were there, right? So he's like, look, I was about to sign paper. I took the deposit, but if you want it, I'll do the deal with you, right? So, and I signed that lease and now it's like, like wow. my end all be all, like it is like, like the future of my empire was built for this place, right? So I wouldn't stop till I got a penthouse. I kept looking at every penthouse. I knew this is all that I wanted. It popped up out of nowhere. If that sequence of events does not happen, I never get the place, right? And, and so to me, I can't help but think, thinking over and over and over again that you just created that moment and your action then created this even more inexplainable circumstance of you pulled up on a Sunday at 10 a.m. and a guy just happened to be stepping out of the building that was getting something from there. So you can, you know, it's not logical or you can't scientifically uh, put something to it that says, hey, um, this is nothing more than sheer coincidence but it's still i could give you a hundred of those that happen in my life so i attempt to do it over and over and attempt to manifest what i hope out of every single thing that i do um, in an effort to move the universe and the intangibles that i ultimately have no control over right is sort of the idea of it and have a pretty good hit rate enough to where I get better at it and do it more and more. So I've doubled down. I've doubled down. Uh, but that's why I did this. That's why look, I like this and, because and, but you I guys also, are almost like look, different look, religions dead opposites, to the yeah. same. And you know it's, what I'm saying? And I also think that's a – it's an unu- – I don't know many people that think about it the way that I have or have the stories of where it's applied in yeah. such a way, right? Like – you know, and and to me, you know, to argue the idea of putting your himself in the way of the golf ball, he was already in the golf ball. He was like, he just felt that golf ball coming, right? And <laughs> I knew it. That's like the universe, <laughs> right? Happening. Like, and I think that that happens. The fact that it happened, though, right? Yeah. And and I think it happens to me all the time, which I think is another thing, especially when you start to know those things happen. Why it's so important for me to control my thoughts because they 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 can be dangerous in a lot of ways too you yeah. know yeah, yeah. i agree I, I think it's cool and i think that the cool thing about it is from all the people i've interviewed is most successful people believe some range of this exact same thing right, right. your thoughts do matter on one way or another um, your actions your plans your clarity of what you really want it all matters it's just the different scale of how you kind of see it right i think that the reticular activator is like a huge scientific i myself don't have a clear uh mindset on this one that i'm going to go to bat for but i do draw naturally i look for a little bit more of an explanation Mm -hmm. of why a manifestation could work and that's what leads you to the rac or whatever it's called right ras yeah Yeah. ras um so it's so interesting to me that there is it's like sure i've seen it happen with you a million times you're like a master wizard at it right and then the science, the science behind it of why you see things. You know, there's so many things going on in the world. There's so right. many noises that are actually happening right now that we're not hearing because our brain focuses on certain things. Yeah. And it's the reason why when you think red Prius, you see a red Prius over and over. It's the reason why uh, the white Apple iPhones made it feel like everyone on earth had an iPhone, right? Yeah. Because your brain sees these things over and over. So. There is some belief that if you are looking specifically for a path and you're so clear on who you're going to become and what is meant for you, your brain will actually lead you to that, right? On top of that, obviously, I believe in energy and all the crazy yeah. things. So I'm right in the middle. Yep. Yeah, and I think it is the the energy thing, but I will tell you what it does. Oh, man, this guy. This, he's a professional, man. <laughs> man. Man. <laughs> this is not happening. Oh, man. You manifested. Yo, you this guy, look, man. Right, right, man. He's like, yeah. That's it. That's manifestation. Look, he was just thinking, man, I hope my one. phone doesn't go off. I hope my phone doesn't go <laughs> off. He was thinking. Look, I, I, I want to say that it's one of the, I'm, it's another thing of my overall happiness and where I get overwhelmed with gratefulness and in all of like the existence that I live, it's a major part of it, right? Where it's just like, God, you, you just know there's just some sort of bigger layer that's not understandable if this happens to you consistent mm-hmm. consistently, yeah. right? And then you lead this sort of in, incredible life and and are extremely happy and 
and and have built it so you have this this also this great uh, sense of fulfillment in how that you did it but but an understanding of all these x factors just add a deeper layer of gratefulness to the entire thing you know and and it's it's something that i think it's a skill too which you got to believe in and start to practice for it to ever fully work but i don't yeah. know it could be, just be some weird magic thing practice man well, the point is whether it's Bring chemistry, or it's the universe's energy, or whether one are both the same, yeah. right? The, the the two are the same. Uh, there's something that we don't. There's something beyond us that we got to try to tap into. And I think it's about playing the game. You know, for me, it's it's like all I've got. I think about my upbringing and my childhood. You know, I went to 17 different schools, five different states, and um, you know, grew up on welfare and all these things. And as soon as I started to tap into um, the law of attraction and how it worked, my life shifted. I, you know, went from being like a punk ass high school dropout to making my first six figures when I was 18 legally and then earning my first meal by the time I was 23, never taking some sort of crazy schooling besides the schooling of uh, how my mind works and the law of attraction. And I play it on a, a big level and I play it on a really fun daily level. I have about 350 photos of times where I manifested in 10 seconds or less in highly difficult locations, the best parking spot. <laughs> I mean, like, <laughs> it's unreal. It is unreal. Yeah. Yeah, I can't even, I'm talking beachfront, 4th of July. Mm. I'm talking at a concert. I'm talking at the new restaurant that just opened. The now anybody could get a parking spot because yes, people do leave. But I, <laughs> I, I, um, I play the game on a level of uh, location, difficulty, and time. Mm -hmm. So if it's a new hot neighborhood or um, shopping center, that's a parking difficulty level nine. And uh, I play it with a point system, and I've gotten high level points over three three hundred times. The times when I don't, I was in a grumpy mood and I was having resistance to life. Mm -hmm. So for me, whether it's resistance because I spilled coffee on my shirt, argument with my wife, um, somebody's trying to screw me over, whatever it might be, resistance is resistance. Mm -hmm. When I have resistance to what's going on in my life, I can't attract the perfect parking spot, mm -hmm. let alone closing an awesome deal. Mm -hmm. So to me, it is a daily game of getting uppercut and being like, cool, thank you. That's awesome. <laughs> Why? Because if I don't accept that uppercut, that jerk, that traffic, that whatever it might be, get ready. I got 20 escrows going at one time. They're all going to fall apart. It's it's happening. <laughs> and so I have to shift it. I have to FaceTime my daughter. I have to listen to Wu-Tang. I have to do something <laughs> to get into the right positive state. And then boom. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I just believe that... Um, we become what we think about yeah. every single day of the week. Let me, let me, uh, we can, <laughs> we can always edit this out. We can always edit this out, but I love manifesting parking spots, right? And you do that? Yeah, yeah, Hell I did the yeah. same thing, right? And now, now I'm realizing it's just a, it's for people that believe in manifestation. Yeah. They believe they can apply it to just about anything. But I also, um, when I miss, it's just sad. Yeah. You know what I mean? Why when do you it, miss though? Like I don't I can't equate it to overall energy because I'll be running in hot. Like give me the like especially like when we park to uh, when me and my wife go to this breakfast spot, it's the hardest place and like literally like when I'm driving, like it's always like front row, front row. So when it doesn't mm -hmm. happen, when I'm like gonna be normal, like it it doesn't happen, then I'm I'm yeah super devastated and what's wrong with Absolutely. me. Now, even though I'm attempting to manifest it, I still think I just got lucky a lot of times. You yeah. know what I mean? As opposed to doing it. But but it just shows that when you believe in it, yeah. you tr you apply it to just about anything. You know. I've noticed when I don't manifest a parking spot, and we should just finish gonna, the whole yeah, last look, we're gonna podcast delete this. on this. No, this is it. <laughs> this is everything. Because whether it's a parking spot or your dream spouse or your dream house, it's the ability to ask, believe, receive. So in there's a level. First step one, ask. I want the perfect parking spot. Step two, believe. Yup, it's coming. Step three is receive it. When I don't receive it, it's an issue. I notice of two things: my energy, my vibes aren't right, or two, my attachment to that thing. So I'm needing it. I'm thinking about it. I'm I'm too attached to the perfect parking spot. 
And so those are the two blockage. So I have to ask for it. And if I get it, cool. If I don't, I'm taking a little stroll with my wife. You know what I mean? When I want it too much, I don't get it. Yeah, and look, I, I, you know, I want to bail on all parking spot talk, but all right. uh, even though I love it, since I'm like validating it so deeply, <laughs> I do think it is being overly, being able to operate at a really high level, uh, but not be too attached to a single thing determining the greater outcome yeah. is is another really significant. Uh, layer to peace and balance right it's it's when you can position yourself where the where the chess pieces that you're moving it's okay to 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 put them in the wrong place from time to time rather than putting yourself in a position to where you can uh your entire house of cards can collapse right. off of a single sort of move yeah. you know i think that's a another major piece when when building a life and building your overall path to to success it's also also sustainability and and creating micro risk and being able to take micro failures along the way is a, is a much better place to be in than, than putting all your eggs in one basket at any one time. Yeah, that's good. I think a lot of that has to do also, one of the things in my, my coaching I help, when I notice people are stuck, I ask them, or they're dealing with the challenge, I ask them to let's go some layers deep and let's go to your worst case scenario. When you can deal and fully accept and dance with your worst case scenario, that is, an, that is a very effective method to help you to push through, to take action, to do whatever you need to do to get to the next level. And, you know, let's say, let's say you're dealing with a lawsuit. Let's say that um, you want to level up the next, you know, your next phase in your career, whatever it might be. But there's some sort of worry and doubt. Um, and you go to the worst case scenario. So what happens if this occurs? Okay, mm -hmm. and what happens if this occurs? Okay, so let's take it a step further. If it fails, you go broke and it doesn't work out and you end up at your mom's house. Mm -hmm. Then what? And then you realize like, I guess I'll be all right. It takes the fear away. Yeah. It's like, well, so no matter what, even if you completely bomb, yeah. you're still good. You'll still have your mind, you'll still have your abilities, you'll still have people who love and appreciate you. Yeah. So what are you afraid of? So now you move forward and you take action on your goal, but you don't have the fear anymore. Yeah. Right? I think it's a very I think facing your worst case scenario is a very effective method to breaking through. But I would also say that for me building a foundation of your worst case scenario <laughs> is what I worked really hard to do. Mm. Right? So that like my foundation, I I've built basically if a, every time I find a, a deeper and further level of success towards my goal, I'm also laying down bricks of the foundation that I can't fall further than the last layer that mm. I built, which is this incredible peace of mind that allows you to stay motivated and allows you to make the, the cleaner, smarter decisions as it relates to moving towards that, that grand goal. Yeah. And I think it's also a great part of of finding success and wanting to to create larger success you you don't it's worth building that foundation so that you now have that security that you get to operate from uh, because it does you're creating your worst case scenario as something that sustains your lifestyle for example is the greatest piece you right. know and and that to me is sort of the first goal that i set out on ahead of chasing uh, the big dream is is laying down that foundation that my lifestyle will be sustained forever mm. over over everything else, and that allows me to then keep my means low in this this sort of place. Even if I am making a ton more money, because like nope, this is what you want right now, and you're using all this additional money not to scale lifestyle, but to build the master plan. Right, right. like that's the. Uh, the aspect of the security that comes along with with managing your own worst case scenario. Yeah, that's good. Heck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> next, okay, this is the next one. I'm going to completely jump topics. Mainly for uh, Tom and Rob. Uh, Kevion and I are more students of this. Yes, sir. Creating content. It's all we hear about. Right, it's all every young person I feel like is told uh, content, Matt, content, content. Can't have enough content. I'm the same way. It's all I hear. It's all I work on. You guys have both, very differently in some ways and similar in others, created a shit ton of content and also really worked on finding an audience and building a thing and really having a 
something meaningful. My question is, if you're a young person that knows that content is key, how do you start with like making sure that you're making the right type of content that even means anything? You can create a shit ton of content and nobody can care. How do you make sure that it resonates? How do you make sure that it has value? How do you build an audience? Like, What do you guys think about when you're, when you're creating content and trying to make it something valuable? Well, in the social space, mm -hmm. um, so I definitely, uh, I think Rob's got me clobbered to death uh, in the, the bigger world of content creation. But in the social space, I will say that um, my biggest piece of advice to people is to understand that content bifurcates into two different types. You've got stuff where you're learning. So think of a podcast, right? So mm -hmm. you're not trying to preach or teach. You're trying to drink it in, ask the right questions, unlock the value from your guest. Mm -hmm. Then you've got content where you're trying to teach, mm -hmm. preach something. Um, if you are not yet extraordinary at something, then you want to start in the where you're trying to learn something and then guests can come or the viewers come along with you on that journey. On the other hand, if you want to be like a social influencer, that's your thing. My piece of advice to people is to become extraordinary. Like that's the first and foremost. So when you are really good at something and you can talk to that thing that you're really good at or leverage that thing that you're really good at to create something, mm -hmm. then people have a reason to show up and play. And I'll say, I don't know, Rob, if you feel the same way, but for me, I got into business because I wanted to be a filmmaker and I needed to control my resources. And so I spent you know, 15 years head down just learning to be an entrepreneur because I had a grand plan, a mission, and I needed that piece in order to build what I wanted to build. So I wasn't thinking, oh, this will be great. One day I'll be paid to speak or what? Like that didn't even enter my mind. I needed to be good at business for the sake of being good at business. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I developed a skill set that now has become an additional stream of monetization, but that's not where it started. And I see so many people that want to start off the jump making content. Like they want to get famous for being famous, mm -hmm. if you will. Um, and that always worries me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and look, Rob, for how me, do you think about it? Because it's interesting that you have created, obviously, like I always, you, you've you've heard the interviews that I've done, and I give you um, the credit you deserve for conceptualizing all of these shows and stuff. Mm -hmm. But what always blew my mind now, from this sort of point of view, is like you were able to just sort of create these worlds. It wasn't; it was kind of inspiration based, but not heavy handed, right? It wasn't. You didn't try to be too educational, but you were able to create these worlds of crazy entertainment and really own massive amounts of loyal people. Yeah, and, and look, I would say mine was the opposite. You mm -hmm. know, since I was an entrepreneur first, that it was, I looked at the uh, content as media. I looked at it as, as attention and scale to advertise all of the revenue streams that I had, right? Mm -hmm. And whether that was... Uh, the way that I renegotiated all of my deals into royalty deals before Robin Big popped because I knew like I saw what had happened with Bam and the sale of all of his products. So I renegotiated all of that looking at like I'm just going to integrate all this. I went out and bought Rogue Status to like have like a clothing brand to go a part of it after the first season renegotiated and and did a deal with Monster over Red Bull. Like I, I always looked at it uh, as as a platform for to scale uh, business ventures and revenue opportunities. And that's why when I wrote Fantasy Factory, it was like, okay, I, I saw what just happened with Robin Big and how I was able to monetize that. Let's build a show that's just about that. And I would say early on, like Fantasy Factory was really, you know, even though we integrated a business story in every single one, it, you know, the idea really early on was to be like really launch business after business. Like the vision was like a Forbes uh, celebrity 100 on on you're going to scale into to this building and this building is going to become famous. And like, you, you know, it's going to be the, all these businesses that are launched from here. But at the end of the day, um, that was too difficult to time up. Mm -hmm. nor was it nearly as ent entertaining as creating fake business ideas around super funny stories. And like, you know, yes, it was still built to create revenue streams, whether it's the Chevy deal that went, you know, from the Super Bowl commercial to the season premiere to the viral video to uh, a title sponsor of Street League. It was this, this fully integrated multi-platform universe of brands and media um, was the overall vision, right? Mm -hmm. And the platform had its scale 
that re- reach the audience as opposed to what you guys are doing is like you have to build that audience yourselves rather than mm-hmm. be on someone else's platform and there's a there's a there's a lot more value in that long term because you control it and i i would I would also argue right now at this day and age, like, you know, even though it seems like there's sort of this this sort of boom of inspirational individuals and different uh, people creating content or uh, inspiring uh, action and individuals on all different Uh, types and forms and it seems like oh there's so many of it right now like i think it's like literally just the beginning Mm -hmm. i think 20 years from now you all are going to be like mega stars of like the and there's it's going to be the same way hip-hop was in the the 80s and 90s were like oh what is this like eventually now it's like rules music like i really think like this sort of like inspirational entertainment and educational entertainment that's that's really helping people become better people and inspiring people is going to be a much larger much more massive genre that you guys are all leading into the future right mm-hmm. now and uh, for me I see the way the platforms are being created and you're going to own that entire ecosystem, right? I just think there's going to be so much more value in that than you can even see right now um, because you are the platform. So I, I see so much potential in that opportunity. And, and for me, I still don't look at I, I that's why I don't like doing interviews. It's hard for me to ultimately speak and, and how I look at content to create like – like that's a lot of work to create those type of platforms and ultimately what it is and and i do think it has to come from a not only a lens of lens of authenticity but giving real value Mm -hmm. you know i think you know the old gary v will just be like get up and shoot it just go just get that content going and like you know (laughs) you know what i mean which i love you know what i mean hearing his him just going hard left and right i love it i I listen to it all the time but i don't believe in it right like in the sense of just just shoot it and go i still think there's giving values the cornerstone of it right so whatever you're going to create it, even if it's just shooting you with a, a cell phone of yourself and walking through why this house is valued at what it is is now this incredible amount of value to someone because now you're teaching them what makes something more valuable mm-hmm. in, in a world of of how difficult it is to understand the pricing of real estate especially in southern california right but i i think that value uh, ultimately is the great determination of the success because it, if you create the right value, you start to build a core and then you have the chance to scale into the more, right? Mm-hmm. But it, it really, really boils down to the value that you create for individuals. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, the big question also, Rob, that you're really focusing on right now, but I, I, I'm also interested to hear your guys' take because you've built extremely successful businesses is you know i know that you're spending a lot of time and energy on building and investing in businesses right and i feel like you've learned a lot uh over the years from kind of just like gunslinging as you call it and trying to build businesses and stuff like that what are sort of the go-to things to look out for that you have learned from all of your years of doing this when it comes to building a successful business finding the right opportunity in the market um and having something that really has a chance to succeed. Do you have kind of like here's the go-to, like the first things you look for when you're now doing one? I look, it's it's there's so many X factors, it's virtually impossible to predict. Uh, because even stuff that you think is great white space still will be too hard to find an audience for. Something like a bit too on on the edge that's too too new may be difficult, and it ultimately depends on who it is. But every single business that I have launched in this last two years cost more money, took more time, uh, and was harder to find the consumer than it than it was at conception, right? And and I think that that lends to uh, really understanding your product market fit and doing a ton of testing with your idea and getting feedback uh, before you invest in building the bodies against it, uh, making sure that, that, that you understand who you're going to sell it to and how you're going to reach them and then, then get as much runway as you can. And if you don't have investment, then it's just like bringing on people... 
uh, to help you or consultants or whatever it is, not not building out a team right away until you prove that you found a way to find that audience and begin to scale it. Right. And, and I think with every single business, as you build it early on, we refer to it as the one body away theory. Uh, where it's like you kind of get stuck and you're like, what's the one thing we're missing? In our production company, it was like just someone that had built and sold a production company. And that one body got put in there and moved around all the pieces, hired the right legal teams, the accounting teams, like uh, created the new right revenue streams and all that stuff. You know, in our luxury, uh, luxury uh, accessory business, it was like we had this incredible team, but we were missing the operator to, to deal with all the manufacturing and all the moving parts to actually keep the company running smooth. Because what you find of doing so many businesses – you want to be an advisor and inspire. You want to like help like guide the thing into the right places, help them make all the right decisions and advise. But if you start working, that means there's a missing piece inside there. And and every time that piece gets filled and you go back to advising, it it it's like the most incredible feeling because it smooths out the entire journey for the business. And I think most people that start a business it's hard to recognize what you're missing when you're in the fire because at the end of the day, it will only be successful off of the resourcefulness and the true commitment of the actual founder and vision of the, the company itself, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's the great founders and great visionaries of a business are working so much deeper, doing so much more than you, that they just blow your mind constantly. You know you're with someone who's the real deal when like, you know, the black feather whiskey guys, he's like, dude, check out this app. And it's like, to grab one of the bottles. And like, I just open up the app and it's like a full AR app where you hold the bottle up and it's talking to you. You're like, what the, like, it's like outstanding foods. It's like, um, you know, it's like, it's, it's showing their, they have this giant influencer uh, party to launch their social media and just scale their social media and all this stuff. It's like, it's like watching these great founders and visionaries like, like really do stuff that you don't understand how they have time is mm -hmm. the is the deep secret sauce mm -hmm. to a business being successful and and there's just no matter how you choose to do it it's a dog fight through and through uh up until the day you get liquid right and it's like i think it's the the reality of when you look at it you've got to decide what you want out of it as a group like okay it's let's have it uh, be a $10 million business that kicks off $3 million and let's split that. That's the business we're making. Okay, let's reinvest in this business and grow it to uh, $30 million and sell it for four times revenue. Let's grow this alcohol business to $10 million and sell it for 10 times revenue, right? Like we know we're going to have to raise here, here, and here in, in order to keep the lights on to get to that liquid strategy. But I think like most people just don't look at a business on – on how they're going to actually make money from it because either they're driven by passion or driven by just wanting to get it done and just a handful of things that we do just to ensure that we're taking a swing that has a much better chance at success mm -hmm. you know yeah i that's so all spot on incredible answer so i'll take it from a different angle mm -hmm. which is to say the struggle is guaranteed the success is not so whatever it is that you want to do, it's going to be like you were saying, it's going to be way harder. It's going to be way more expensive. It's going to take way more time than you think. And the only thing that's going to keep you going to solve those business problems is if it's giving you that energy I was talking about earlier, right? Mm -hmm. So the more you engage with it, the more energized you are, you're having fun. You want to be in this environment. You want to think through these problems and you're going to keep going because at the end of the day, like, and unfortunately I learned this the hard way. My first company was a technology company, which nobody ever talks about. Hey, <laughs> um, even though ironically that company was the first time where on paper, and let's really differentiate between paper and liquid, but I made myself a multimillionaire mm -hmm. and I only ever talk about it as a cautionary tale, right? So think about in your own life, you create something that makes you a multimillionaire. And yet it is your cautionary tale mm -hmm. because I hated <laughs> every minute of it, right? I was so unhappy. I was not having fun. And the chasm between the paper money and the real money is massive. Mm -hmm. So what I would encourage people to do, because building a business is so hard, make sure that you believe in what you're trying to create, that you think you can add a ton of value to somebody's life, because that's the only way that it's going to sell, and that the universe of things that it puts you around mm -hmm. 
is something that you enjoy, right? So for anybody that's not been here to these offices, if you like clothes, this is such a cool place. It was funny, Rob and I were getting the tour, and Rob's like, I dig your closet vibe. Because every room you go into has like double racked yeah. clothes, and you literally feel like you're in the world's biggest closet. Yeah. Now, as somebody who has launched an apparel brand, mm -hmm. mine failed um, in, being around that stuff, I actually really liked it. Mm -hmm. And the kind of marketing that we were doing, I really liked it. Mm -hmm. And getting to walk into a store and care about the fashion and really think like, how would I reach this market? Is this something that we could do? Learning from a pleat, like all of that stuff was so much fun for me. Mm -hmm. And so even though that business failed, it, was, it wasn't painful in the way that the technology company was painful because I didn't care about it. Mm -hmm. So the success, unfortunately, is not guaranteed, yeah. but the day-to-day -day grind is going to be. So finding a way to build a business around something that you care about, every element of it, that lights you on fire. So we're now, Impact Theory is a media company, right? So we ultimately want to make film and TV. So how do we get there? By comic books. Why comic books? The answer is twofold. One, it's a traditional feeder into film and TV. It's visual storytelling. But two, I just love comics. And so I knew being around comics, negotiating with artists, um, getting the, you know, the, what I'll call dailies, which is more of a film term, but getting the pages as they're coming in and like seeing the artwork, like that amps me up. Like whether or not I was making money off that, that's exciting to me. Being in a story meeting, it's exciting to me. Mm -hmm. So finding that thing that's gonna be fun. So imagine like what does crashing and burning look like in this business? Would you still enjoy it? And if you would, and if you really believe in what you're trying to do, so like why are we building a media empire? Because I believe the way that people build that mindset that we were talking about before, the kid in the inner cities, it's your story. Mm -hmm. And so it's parents, friends, story. I can't control the parents and friends. The only thing that I can control is the stories, the narratives that he encountered that, or she, that make them think in a new way, mm -hmm. right? So that being a part of that, I really believe in that. So it's, my dad gave me a plaque once. It said, find something that you would die for and live for it. And I thought that was the best business advice mm -hmm. ever. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you, did, did, will you apply sort of the impact theory sort of, uh, uh, mindset and all the stuff that you're teaching into the way you create the comic book. So the storytelling inside there will also be sort of giving you knowledge and uplifting, or is it more traditional comic storytelling? No, it's an entirely about empowerment. So yeah. I, I was looking at the industry. So I play a game called No Bullshit, What Would It Take? So we are starting Quest. No Bullshit, What Would It Take to End Metabolic Disease? And you can tell people to eat less and exercise more, and it will work for exactly everybody that does it. But most people won't do it because it sucks. And so we were looking at it saying, all right, for 70 years, fitness has been in everybody's face, and it hasn't worked So in terms of the general population. So what if we made food that they could choose based on taste, and it happened to be good for them? So that was our no bullshit there, and obviously it worked very well. So I'm looking at mindset. Many people are antagonistic to change. And in fact, one thing I wanted to say, but we got so deep on the parking lot thing, I thought I'll just let it ride. <laughs> <laughs> but one thing I wanted to say is, is listen to what I'm not saying, right? So what was my default position? My default position was to listen, to learn, to drink in your um, arguments. I think you're both really bright people. And so what good does it do me to push back and fight? It doesn't, right? Like, I want you to be right. I hope it's true. And so only people that are focused on being right, like, really go hard for that. Like if I sat here and argued with you, like it, there's just no logic in it to me. Yeah. Way better to be like, wow, man, like if this works, it's fucking powerful. And so far better for me to go try it rather than to sit here and just want people to understand that I still think the way that I think, right? So, but most people are antagonistic to that. Most people actually argue at that point. So I know I'm trying to give a new mindset to people who are actively antagonistic to change. So how would I be able to do that? I need to give them characters that they can look up to. So I'm playing the game, no bullshit, what would it take? I'm looking at who's done it the best? Disney, right? Why Disney? Because Disney is the only studio in all of media history that's ever had the discipline to only tell one kind of story and to tell it from a thousand different angles so that the name brand itself means something. So if I say I'm gonna go see a Sony movie or a Warner Brothers movie or a Paramount movie, you don't know anything about it. Right. But if I say I'm gonna go see a Disney movie, I don't even have to tell you the title you already know something about it because their brand name means something. So Impact Theory, the only story we will ever tell that will come in a thousand different shades will be a story of somebody going from not believing they can do it to realizing that they can. And that's it because to me that is the human journey is that moment of awakening where you realize, whoa, I can make real the things that I can envision. And so let me say something. Yeah. I love that so much. Like, I just love it so much. And I, I, I was searching for that answer in watching the content 
of what the comic books would lead to that empowerment story. Like I don't, I, it didn't, it hasn't been told to me yet, right? So I wasn't wasn't clear on what the impression is, and I that sort of core messaging for what impact theory can be. Now it's so clear to me. Awesome. Now I see the talk show. Now I see the different shows. Now I see whether it lives on television, short form. You could bring in multiple people that could do their own shows on the platform. The the animation side, whether or not it becomes a movie, it could be it, limitless, right? Like through that single lens. But it's the first time that we've discussed it or I've heard it, even though watching all of your different content that I've gathered that, mm. you know what I mean? Which I just yeah, love. And that's gonna be huge for us to get that out there. And the shorthand that I use for people, you know, in in sort of close settings like this is Disney built the most magical place on earth. And our goal is to build the most empowering place on earth. And the only way that you do that is through just an inhuman level of consistency. And so we have I'll speak to comics for a second just because it has its own needs. We have three pillars in comics. One is, first and foremost, every story we tell is a story of empowerment, period. Like, that's it. Like, there are a million, literally a million great stories that I will love as a consumer and I would love to go watch, but will never tell because it doesn't reinforce that empowerment, which is literally my mission in life. Uh, number two, all of our books come out on time. That's just like, it's a thing that really plagues the um, comic industry. Um, and then just telling great stories. At the end of the day, this has to be entertainment. And the moment we fail to entertain and we think that we can just preach or educate, uh, we'll lose. So when I look at the movies um, that are to a frame, the movies that I hope we make like this one day, The Matrix, right? Straight entertainment. Most people don't even think of it as a story about belief, but it is entirely a story yeah. about belief. And if I went and gave you a lecture on it and then you watch the movie, you'd be like, oh my God, from start to finish. This is simply a movie about one guy learning to believe in himself. And then once he believes he can bend the rules of the matrix, he can, but nothing changed about the matrix. Something changed about him. And then he was able to do things that other people weren't able to do. Star Wars is another one. Um, Rocky, Rocky Four, Karate Kid, like all films, 100%. They are, you could put a stamp, impact theory. They're the exact kind of thing. It's a story that is um, empowering through and through the, you know, Star Wars is a, literally a guy from a farm who longs of being important and making his mark in the world and learns the way of the Jedi, learns to stop being an impetuous child and learns to like Zen out and then becomes a great warrior as a result. But they're all entertainment first. And so even though empowerment is our absolute like core centerpiece, we have to entertain first and foremost. Yeah. That's clarity, guys. Love it. Love it. Uh, okay, I'm just going to ask you guys some rapid fire questions. I'm going to let you get out of here because you're giving me more than enough time, and I know you're all very busy. First question for each one of you. Knowing what you know now, going on this journey, what do you wish you had spent more and less time doing for, in your whole life? Well, um, I'll, I'll give you the easy one. I was very, very lazy. I still am lazy by nature. That's my default. Um, I just wish I had learn to be disciplined in service of my goals much faster. Yeah, I would say um, more of, I would say more uh, being aware of my finances. You know, as when you're 18 and you start to do well, you think it's never gonna stop. So um, that would have been something that I would have liked to be uh, more aware of is planning. And uh, less would be worry. You know, spending less time worrying about things that could potentially happen mm -hmm. in my younger days, just uh, just enjoying the process. Well, take it back to that life planning. Now, mm -hmm. if it was up to me, I would. I I know if I would have had uh, tactically figured out a lot more things uh, early on and had that clarity, um, I would have been able to build a foundation uh, much deeper today to to continue to elevate off of i think it was those gunslinging days and the free-for-all of having a general vision of of what you wanted to be uh but but no clear path to truly the type of person or life you wanted to actually lead just the things you wanted to accomplish and i i, I believe if if i would have had that early on um it would have calmed my path down in a major way yeah mm -hmm. Especially if I was like 30 or so and I would have had that thing. Man, I'd be so psyched. You think that that's what caused any um, like distractions or lack of focus? Like, do you think that lack of clarity leads to lack of, I don't want to say lack of focus because it's kind of no shit, right? But like yeah. 
when you look back at your lives and you so far and you think like, man, I wasted a lot of time doing that. Do you think that it's because you weren't clear enough on your goals and therefore like didn't have that focus? Does that make sense? That's 100 percent what I think for myself. Yeah. Right. And by not having a clear, deep understanding of what you want to do and how you want to do it, you end up doing all these things thinking thinking it's going to create an answer for you rather than deciding what the answer is, then only doing things that lead to the answer, right? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. I think that's just the, the difference. And I could point to a million and one things that, sure, I learned a ton from it. And yeah, a lot of it was an incredible experience, but I could have put that same level of energy and failed quicker, learned more, and got further by having that clarity, you know? And, and I'm... I'm also incredibly thankful that I have it today, mm -hmm. right? And and I just think, yes, it would have been nice to have it, but the the truth is 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 be very grateful that you live in it today because you live the life that you wish you would have lived now. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. I think we're all going to end up on some path. We're all on a path, and we're all going to end up at some destination. And I think a lack of clarity, you know, could very well cause you of arriving at a place that you don't really want to be. You know, like I think about my son, he's 17 and he's a he's a he's a little dude and he's been approached by um, somebody to potentially be a jockey. What do you think? <laughs> just my it just blew my mind. He's he's 17 year old. Yeah, he's 17 years old. I was freaking out on that. Man, wow. Yeah, I was a junior in high school. You know, great way to get going early, guys. <laughs> so I tell I tell my whole team, I, have, I run a real estate team of an average like 25 year old. I tell them all just knock somebody up quick okay you want to improve your creature production get somebody pregnant light a fire under. no and and you know my son is in that seeking mode right now where he plays the drums and he surfs and you know he loves the lord he's an incredible dude and while he was working he got approached by this dude who is a jockey trainer he does something and he's got my son thinking well maybe i should do that and so i cautioned him that you know, what's most important is that he is clear on what he wants with his life, because if he's not, it's very, very easy to get caught up in the world's agenda. Well, maybe you should do this. Well, maybe you should do that. I'm like, hey, you can consider it, but I want you to really think about what you want, mm -hmm. because if you're not clear on what you want, it is very easy for you to get caught up in the world's agenda. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the thing that I struggled with um, was not clarity in the beginning because I, I wasn't ready for clarity. I was hopeless mm -hmm. and I didn't believe in myself and didn't think that I could do anything extraordinary. Um, and so for me, that was the first step was just believing that as a human being that I could grow and get better mm -hmm. and thusly be able to execute at the highest level. Then once I was prepared to improve myself, clarity became the single most important thing. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite failure? Usually I steer by saying like, it's usually something that you can think back on. We all look back on the things that we were scared of or we failed and we thought were such a big deal in the moment and ended up being kind of that number one thing that like we laugh at now or, or maybe put us on a better path or gave us that clarity. What comes to mind when I ask that? Tom, you have one? Yeah, for me, um, you know, I talk a lot about it now from the way that I look at it now, but at the time I was really ashamed when I went in and quit the technology company mm -hmm. and I gave my partners equity back and, and, um, you know, I'd promised I was going to make my wife wealthy. And here I was like, just so miserable and unhappy that I was literally giving back millions of dollars in equity, mm -hmm. um, because I, I couldn't do it anymore. And I definitely saw that as a failing, like I should be able to push and grind and like make it through. And, but I'm just so profoundly unhappy that I can't do it anymore. And so, yes, I go on to learn the lessons that set me up for success from that. Um, but at the time, I was just embarrassed. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. Kip? That's a, a very difficult answer. There's a lot of them. Mm -hmm. I would say one of my main ones was around 2015, 2016. Our brokerage, Keller Williams, the largest real estate company in the world, like 120,000 people. It's very big on growth and grow a team. And I grew the fastest team the whole company's ever seen. We grew a team of 65 agents. So I had 65 agents on the case team in 18 months. And um, it really created a major loss of culture within my brand. There was the original core group of 12 who didn't feel appreciated. They didn't feel taken care of. Um, then I had people who just weren't doing my program right. 
Um, I had people stealing from me. And what the biggest lesson was, was again, just like I told my son, don't get caught up in somebody else's vision. Mm -hmm. I was caught up in our founder's vision. It's a great vision. He can rock with that. That's not the same as what my vision is. I have now reduced the company from 65 to 23, and I'm just pouring into that 23. Mm -hmm. I'd like to create the highest per production group of just ninja closers and pour into this group of my my friends the people who stuck with us as we went through this this process mm -hmm. you know this kind of trimming process mm -hmm. um and that was the biggest the biggest one for me is losing the culture of my company but also the greatest lesson because you know contrast creates clarity it really showed me who the exact person was i really wanted on the squad and we've got that now Rob? Uh, no doubt, uh, the purchase of DNA. No yeah, doubt, man. Yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, I, I would I would call it the peak, the greatest failure, the purest humbling that made me realize that you just do not understand business mm -hmm. in any way, shape, or form, mm -hmm. yet you had the audacity to go out and acquire a business uh, without fully understanding um the business itself and then putting your passion and your bravado and letting the story of you being the hometown kid from Ohio that came back 20 years and acquiring uh, what was a very uh, dysfunctional and dangerous business that was burning cash and on its way out of business. But you thinking just because you're you, it will be successful. Mm, yeah. and, and for the listener who doesn't know, DNA was Alien Workshop Habitat, Rob's original sponsors, essentially. Mm. So the story was he could go back and buy the thing and revive the childhood company, yeah. and that's a great story. Yeah, it's the company that I turned pro for that then they sold to Burton, mm. and Burton wanted to sell it, and I wanted to acquire it for a, a handful of different reasons. Um, and and it just became a disaster. And these are guys I grew up with in yeah. Ohio. And and to give you the, it seared in me, what it takes to build a business. Like and fully understand. Then I said, nope, I'm not going to stop there. I want to now understand every single thing that there is to a business. That I now have pure core general knowledge on every single aspect. So that when I move forward, I am now operating from. Uh, a completely different lens on how I look at opportunity and and it it's a beautiful story too because it's actually what created the entrepreneur that I am today and the 16 companies that we went out and built including the three that I had and re-engineered them and went and made those massive companies based off of that pain wow and then the beauty of it is is I knew the lesson that I had learned I had lost $4 million and I, rather than try to recoup it, I just turned to the original founders and just gave them each. There was three brands and each of them had found it. And I gave all the original founders who had very little equity, I just gave them the brands completely and let them have it back and run it. Because I knew the lesson was learned. Like, I'm a builder. I want to be a part of stuff that I created, not invest in other people's ideas. And ultimately... Like it was a small industry and a small business and my way of thinking did not fit with mm -hmm. it. And I was it would only be doing a disservice to my history and the legacy of the brands if I was to try to to manage it and creep back all the money that I had lost. I uh, felt like it was just the right thing to do. And I had learned uh, really the deepest and realest lesson and then set off on a mission to learn all of that. And by releasing it back to those guys who now run it today and each own it 100% and is um, is seared in me so deep. And it is now um, the reason that everything I do is so less personal. Everything is, is done more from a creative and financial combined. And I look at everything, why I look at everything operationally and financially and, 
and what it takes to actually build and run a successful business and identifying that in people and only investing in those people that understand the operation, the financial side and have the ability uh, to, to manage people and take an idea to market that has a clear path to profitability, sustainability and one day an exit. Right. Like that was seared from going through that pain. So it's a failure at like a very epic proportion uh, but it shifted my entire existence into the direction that it is today that I will now live in for the rest of my life. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't even know that. I didn't know that that impacted you so hard. Oh, tore the soul out of me. Interesting. Oh, man, I'm so happy. Like when I think about like going the year that I went, the year and a half or two that I went through the chaos like of like Dill and Ave and everybody quitting the team yeah. and and then like, you know, the, the manufacturing deal falling apart and then doing a deal with another distributor and then going bankrupt and me having to buy it out of bankruptcy. Like the chaos and the amount of millions of dollars in cash flowing that thing. And because keep in mind, when I purchased this company, I did a deal where I purchased it for two and a half million and then sold half of it for five million. Mm -hmm. That was the deal that I mm. was middlemanning originally. And so I let the public know that I'm at a big announcement in front of all these people that I'm going to buy it, you know, just pure. You did an episode about it, right? No, it was uh, at Zoomies 100K oh, yeah, yeah. where I got out there and said it to the world, like, I'm going to buy this thing. Then literally that deal fell apart. Like literally the next day the person was like, why did you announce? And then they backed out. And then it was like, oh, what? Like, and <laughs> You're like a and then Dr. it was Dre like every person too. around me was like, you cannot do it. This thing loses so much money. You cannot do it. But since I had already said, no, I fell in love with the story yeah. oh, and wasn't able to look at the, the financial model with enough clarity or to fully understand the business, it was all ego and story and like, no, like the kid, like doesn't like he went even further on MTV and then he dug his roots even deeper by buying the, yeah. the workshop. It was all in story and ego and like the the pain that was suffered behind it uh, is invaluable. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it truly is like the almost like the close of a chapter and like welcome to the rest of your life. Yeah. You know? yeah. It's so interesting what like sort of that burning feeling can manifest itself into if you allow it, right? Like even like a lot of people who are very successful had, let's say, rough upbringings or had something to prove or had whatever. But it's funny how even on the smaller levels, the pain of a loss from one purchase or from one company that you hated or whatever can can drive you into such greater progress. You yeah. know what I mean? It's just interesting that we work that way. It's like, so what do you do at a certain point? Do you hunt for pain? You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, how do you, funny, once you get right? everything figured out and everything's happy, are you soft then? Are you missing your fuel? Well, or can you, you work out of hits, like gratitude? Though. I think you still take hits even as you've excelled to a higher level in business. It's just you respond to them differently. Yeah. You know, you take enough hits and it's like, wow, okay. So I know for certain that, you know, the reward, the, the lesson in the L is many times greater than the reward of the win. Mm -hmm. So it's like either way, there's going to be a big win. Mm -hmm. If I fail massively, I know from this failure, this failure, this failure, this failure, this failure, that all of that was worth so much. Mm -hmm. So let's get it then. Mm -hmm. Let's make it happen. You know, like 2011, I lost my best friend. Mm -hmm. I lost my closest uncle and I lost my dad uh -huh. in the six month period. Uh -huh. You know, I could not sell a single home for six months, I'd be on the way to an appointment and just start bawling, you know, the wave hits you and you just can't control it. Mm -hmm. And that darkness mixed with my first daughter being born pushed me into 2012 and I was either going to blow my brains out or create something that lived on mm -hmm. forever. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't have shit before 2012. Mm -hmm. And in a three and a half year period, you know, we took over the game in real estate. Mm -hmm. like. You know, we were number whatever in Wall Street Journal last year, and we didn't have all these other little things that all the other top people have. But we had the vision, the mindset, the belief, the vibe, and the energy, which so much of it came from darkness. Mm -hmm. So much of what, we, what we're doing today came from the L. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think if people could really grasp that if you're losing and you're getting, you're in major breakdown, 
just dance with it and keep looking because what we find depends on what it is we're looking for. Keep looking for the win. Keep looking for the breakthrough because you'll find it every single time. Mm -hmm. Okay, last one. Uh, it's college graduation time, and I'm not as big of a college hater as some people think. <laughs> uh, my question is this. In, in the spirit of college graduation, if you could have two seconds with a kid who just walked off the stage at his college graduation and tell him anything, what would you tell that person? What you build your self-esteem around matters. And that that's like my my big thesis, mm -hmm. you know, like even going to Rob's story about what happened at DNA, you know, the the pride over what he had done became the lens through which he was looking at things. And so whether the lens you're looking at through things through is, you know, distorted positive, distorted negative, whatever the case may be, whatever you decide to take your self worth based on mm -hmm. is going to lead you forward. And so, you know, I talked about it earlier, but my obsession when I was young was being smart and being right. Mm -hmm. And so being in any situation where I wasn't the smartest person made me deeply uncomfortable. So I spent my time being around people who were not as smart as me. And I went through a period that I call the king of remedial jobs period um, where I would go. And my whole goal was to apply for a job where the interviewer would ask me why I was applying for the job. Mm -hmm. Because, oh, you're too smart. You're overqualified. Like, what are you doing here? And that was like my my siren call. I longed for that, <laughs> yeah. you know, for people to think that I was smart. Yeah. And so I ended up in the dumbest jobs you can imagine. Literally at one point, <laughs> this is my favorite dumb job. Uh, I applied for and got hired to drive escorts. Models, models, sorry. Ah, for sure. Nice. Yep. And yeah, I, go, I go home <laughs> and I'm taking a nap and my mom calls me and wakes me up and she's like, it's the middle of the day, why are you sleeping? And I'm like, oh, I got a new job. Doing what? Driving. Driving who? Models. And she freaks out. She's like, those are uh, escorts. Like, you're out of your mind. You can't take that job. So I never actually did the job. I yeah. never worked it. But that was like where I was at in my life. I was, I'd already graduated from college. I had a degree. And yeah. that, those were the kinds of jobs that I was seeking. So yeah. it was just absolutely absurd. And so then starting to realize... You know, unfortunately, nobody was saying it this succinctly, or at least I wasn't hearing it. You're the average of the five people you spend the most time yeah. with, and you want to, you don't want to be the smartest person in the room. And so, just getting around that idea, and then end up, I'm teaching film. These two guys come in, they meet me, and they want to hire me away to uh, their startup, their technology startup. And they said, "But look, this is a startup. You know, don't think of yourself as the copywriter. You can have any job you want. You just have to work your way up." And so I'm like, "Wow, this sounds amazing! Like, let me do this." And I go in. And I'm doing it and I'm like, these guys make me feel really stupid. And so I would argue for ideas that were mine, even though I knew they were wrong for the company. Mm -hmm. And so I remember one day being like, okay, I tell everybody I wanna be rich. And here I am arguing for an idea and I know it's wrong. And I end up convincing them and they agree with me. And I'm like, now having this moment of crisis, do I actually wanna be rich mm -hmm. or do I just wanna feel good about myself? Because if I just want to feel good about myself, then I need to leave this company because these guys are smarter than me. They're way ahead of me on their journey as entrepreneurs. So I can't even add value that way. And they hustle to the nth, right? Mm -hmm. So if just feeling good about myself is my measure of success, I need to leave. Or I need to not worry about feeling good about myself. And I thought that's never going to work. I know that's not sustainable. And I thought, is there a third option where I change what I feel good about myself for? Mm -hmm. And so in that moment, I decided that I was going to pride myself on being willing to admit when I was wrong in real time. And so I could be arguing for something like hard, like totally invest like in this argument. This is what I think. And then if I saw that I was wrong, I would admit it in real time. Be like, you know what? I'm sorry. You actually just convinced me. And then I would put energy behind that idea. And I became obsessed with identifying the right answer mm -hmm. instead of being right. Mm -hmm. And that was the thing that took me from scrounging my couch cushions to find enough change to put gas in my car mm -hmm. to building a billion dollar business. Mm -hmm. Boom. That billion damn, dollar business, man. man. You, can, yeah. you can end with that. Oh, yeah. Bam. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Kev? Can't believe I'm just chilling right here. This is amazing. <laughs> I'm inspired. Um, what would I say to that graduating kid? I would say stick to your craft. Um, or I would say stick to your gift, actually. Mm -hmm. Right? Like uh, in the book, The One Thing, one of the quotes that's really good, it says, be like a postage stamp. Mm -hmm. Stick to one thing until you get there. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second thing I would say is fail fast, mm -hmm. you know, so stick to your gift and fail fast. So the question is, what is your gift? Right. And it, it's important to, to remember the difference between your gift and your passion. Like I can be passionate about basketball. Uh, there's it's just 
highly unlikely that I'm going to make it. Yeah. Right? Your gift is whatever you do the best with the least amount of effort. Mm -hmm. Right? What gets you results with the least amount of effort? That's your gift. And to help try to find your gift, you can go back through your life and you'll see signs of times where you were winning at this thing. Mm -hmm. You know, for a period, like even in fourth, fifth grade, I remember I would like memorize far side lyrics and then I would I would spit them on the bus and like I, I kind of wanted to be a rapper. Yeah. You know, I had this vision of being behind a mic, but I only like conscious rappers. I only like like the qualies, the commons, the Nas's. Yeah. You know, I like that they were saying dope, inspiring stuff. Yeah. And so to me, that was kind of an idea that I had to be on a mic uplifting. Mm -hmm. So I think about that. I think about the fact of like who I've become or whatever. And in skateboarding, I was okay. I had sponsors, but I think my friends liked having me around because I would, I would be like, yo. I remember my one of my really good friends, JP. I remember the first time he did a frontside kickflip switch five zero on a picnic table. Mm -hmm. This is like early '90s. For those of you who don't know, that was a big deal mm -hmm. on a picnic table. And I remember like giving him coaching of like, yo, like, you know, stand right here or move a little bit like this. And I it was very common for me to see things that my friends could do, yeah. even though I couldn't do them, and coach them through, to then coaching Jonas to blow up LRG and yeah. create a $150 million company in five years. And so I thought I needed to be a life coach. Yeah. I couldn't figure out how to make money at that, so I became a real estate agent. The same thing, helping people figure out where they want to go and being an extra set of eyes for people. Mm -hmm. So find your gift. Think about what you do well with the least amount of effort and stick to that thing. And as soon as you can, find people to delegate the rest. Mm -hmm. There's 300 pieces of paper that you need to f sign in a real estate deal. I'm only good at getting one of those pieces of paper signed. Mm -hmm. And I've hired some of the most legendary people on earth to get those other pieces of paper signed. Mm -hmm. So I stick to my gift and I fail fast. Like I fail a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, I was with my, my buddy Daniel earlier today from Rasta Klopp. And one of the things he says is just, just remember, winners, uh, winners fail more than losers do, mm -hmm. right? So fail fast, get out there, screw up and know that that's a part of the process. That's where you learn. Rob, I just walked off stage. What was your uh, education in? Uh, it was sort of general in communications. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I, I'm a, a, a big believer in Tony Robbins' theory on this one, and that's, that's the idea of the earlier you can figure out what you want to master, the better. Um, and, and I think at a young age, if it's not super clear to you, um, you know, if you can have it categorized in a more clear way and get out there and, and learn quickly if this is uh, what you want to become great at and do for the rest of your life. Because I do think uh, people underestimate the long-term value you can bring to yourself in mastery uh, and that it takes a really long time to make something easy for yourself. You know, And I think when you can hone in on that, now you have a gun to point everything that you want to learn and and the more and more you learn the more and more you put around yourself the more confidence you build the the more better relationships you build the the better you are at, at maximizing the opportunity of that mastery i just think you know f for me i started my first company at 18 years old Right, was raised, built my first brand, soup the nuts at 18 years old, named it, drew the logo, built it, put the entire thing together, did all of it, right? Because I was raised by entrepreneur wolves, I thought that was just what I was supposed to do. Everyone around me was an entrepreneur, I just figured that's what it was. Now, I kept getting distracted. Now, yeah, I did businesses my whole life nonstop, but I didn't dedicate myself to the craft of becoming a true businessman. I was a, a skateboarder, entertainer, like partier, uh, you know, like pro athlete. Like I chased a million and different things and I, I, I had proven the ability to put uh, one thing together after another in multiple different industries. But 
uh, it wasn't till I fully realized into my, uh, you know, late thirties that it's like, okay, what do you want to master? Right. And I, and I know it sounds like the intro of the podcast, uh, that you use in my clip of saying oh, it the yeah, exact same bite. way. Yep. God, I just said the sound bite on episode 100, <laughs> uh, but it made all the difference. Right. And, and now once I, I, I got to that level, I can see the nuances of how I'm getting better and better at mm-hmm. it, just even doing it purely from that lens two years in, mm-hmm. you know, and, and launching so many and now learning so much. I can just I almost look at the entire portfolio as like, OK, I get it. I get it now. Right. And it's like you almost feel that way after you do another one. It's like, oh, OK, that's in there. And it's building this even deeper pure level level and confidence of what the future holds um, based off of how much I've grown after I decided I want to master building uh, businesses and scaling them into sustainable, profitable brands, right? It's like that that full dedication um, allowed there to be this much more accelerated learning and uh, you get to play the game over and over and over again. Since I'm not operating them and I'm doing with them with other individuals and help creating it and then financing it, it's it's allowing me to move them to an advisory role, then do the next one and, and apply, okay, this is what I learned from there, and then see all of, triangulate what's working and what's not with all of them to put it together towards a single thing, right? And And that mastery connected with the clarity or the goal of mastery is is I'll be doing it forever. Mm-hmm. It's like mm-hmm. a painter. It's like a musician. It's like anyone else. Like you, you're just going to get better and better at it and build more confidence, like over time. And I just think, like, people don't, especially young people, don't look at what's like. This is something I'm passionate about and I could do for the rest of my life. Let let me just take action to get started and trust as long as I stay committed and learn everything about it that I will get better and better and better over time until uh, I have mastered um, this sector, if you will. Where it leads you, you never know. Yeah. But as long as that's part of the journey, uh, that confidence along the way is going to lead you to success. Yep. Fire. Guys, I can't thank you enough. This was a uh, insane. I got you for two hours and twenty minutes. Man, that was a this overshot. Was an insane episode one hundred. Um, I don't know what else to, else to say other than thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks for giving for me the time. Thank thanks you, for man. coming on this thing. Thanks for coming on the pod. You know, back when it was small. You know, a few months ago. Now we're at episode 100. We're kind of on a different level. <laughs> crazy, really crazy for me because I had never listened to a podcast in my entire life. And I think it was probably the end of 2016. And uh, my wife and I were in like a super motivating state. It was the first time we started waking up at 5 in the morning. Mm-hmm. And I got your podcast uh, on uh, your short story long. Yep. I probably listened. That fueled me for like, two months straight i just kept listening to it the story of you as a kid with with the oranges before the soccer game i was like damn this is sick yeah because for me it was somebody that i could relate to that's playing huge yeah and then i set it as a goal to be on short story long in january 2017 i set it down as a goal to be on short story long and then uh you know, it just kind of happened. Sneaker Steve. Yeah, so thank you, man, yeah. for, like, being somebody that's not about just himself. Like, you did this because you wanted to share knowledge with the world. Yeah. You know? And uh, it's been really cool. Guys, can't thank you enough. Thank we you did man. it. You Congratulations. Did it. Chris Drummond Path to 100 more. Yeah. Yeah. Chris Drummond more. Yeah. Big Kane, can you bring in a, a, this uh, special prize so we can shoot a photo with it? Downstairs. Oh, it's downstairs? Yeah. Damn. I didn't know we were shooting up here. Well, damn, we've been yeah. up here for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know we were shooting. We got some games. Yeah, we got to go right here, buddy. too. Yeah. You can buddy step mine. I'm going to do a... Uh, guys, episode 100. Woo! Super Pod is up now. <laughs> did it again. We did it. You need some, like... My DJ um, sound effects, you know what I mean? Drama, good positive stuff right here.
Guys, if you like that and you want to see more like it as well as vlogs, other web series, and all the random stuff that I'm doing here on YouTube, don't forget to click that subscribe button. You won't regret it, I promise.